The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody. We commence with uh, an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we wish to acknowledge uh, the uh, Wangal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land upon which uh, Commissioner McEwen and I are presently located. We pay our respects uh, to their elders past, present and emerging. We also uh, acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation upon whose lands Commissioner Galbally, who is presently in Melbourne, is sitting. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also pay our respects to all First Nations people attending the hearing today as well as those who may be following the proceedings on the live stream. Yes, uh, Ms Eastman. Thank you, Commissioners. Ms Cudahy, overnight you provided to the Royal Commission solicitors a copy of the minutes for the board meeting on 22 August 2019. Do you have a copy with you? No, I don't. Could that be provided to Ms Cudahy? And is this the document that you located overnight? I believe our lawyers did. I'm sorry? I believe the lawyers did. You might have to speak up. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I believe that the uh, law firm did. Lawyers did. Did you yourself check this document before it was provided to the Royal Commission? No, I haven't seen this document recently. Well, I asked you yesterday whether you could identify the minutes. So I want to know, are these the minutes that you uh, gave evidence about yesterday where you said there was a more fulsome discussion? I believe so, if these are the minutes from Sunnyfield of the 22nd of August 2019. Can you turn to page three or four of those minutes? Certainly. There's a reference in 6.1 to CEO report. Do you see that? Yes. And the minutes um, record uh, that the report was noted and taken as read. That's correct. You spoke to the report, drawing the board's attention in particular to the disability sector market overview and to the NDIS revised 1 July 2019 pricing. Yes, that's what Is that what the fulsome said. discussion? Um, I don't do the minutes of these meetings. They are done by the company secretary. Right. Can I ask you to look at paragraph 8.2? 8.2. <coughs> Yes. Now, this is, says COSEC corporate report. Now, 8.2 seems to match with your uh, note. Is that, do you accept that? I'd need to read it, please. That's correct. Uh, and is that the reference to the fulsome discussion of your report? I don't do the minutes of this report. The minutes are done by the company secretary. She told the Royal Commission yesterday that there was a fulsome discussion at the board. That's my understanding. And my understanding of evidence yesterday is that that would be reflected in the minutes. I said that there would be minutes of the meeting. Now, in these... Uh, minutes with respect to the COSEC corporate report. The second paragraph refers to the board uh, seeking assurance that the internal risk systems and reporting were operating effectively. And you noted that in addition to the internal audit and quality reviews, the NDIS quality and safeguarding, I mean safeguards commission there? Uh, yes, that would be. Uh, I, I didn't do the minutes, as I said, but that would be, I assume, what was correct. Right. Audit process provided external review of the system. Yes. And you refer to a recent audit. Yes. Now, you're aware, aren't you, that uh, at that meeting on the 22nd of August 2019, there was a, an agenda item 
that dealt with review of complaints, incidents, safeguarding policy, procedures and implementation. Can I show you the document at D19? Thank you. Have you seen this document before? I no doubt have, back in 2019. Uh, take, will you take it from me that this is the uh, note in relation to 8.2 for the uh, board meeting and the 8.2 references to the board having requested a report on Sunnyfield systems, processes and training and complaint handling, whistleblower reports, incident management and response team. Yes. And uh, if one looks at this appendix for agenda item 8.2, and it's quite a lengthy report ending with a flow chart of the response team process for quote, serious, end quote, allegations of abuse, assault and neglect. There's a flow chart. Yes. Okay. What I want to put to you is that with respect to the minutes that you've got, the minutes that record 8.2 are the minutes that reflect discussion about this document, the review of complaints, incidents and safeguarding policy. Would you agree with that? It appears so. And with respect to your report, which is, um, if you want to go back and have a look at that again, Commissioners, you'll find that in Tender Bundle, sorry, Hearing Bundle, uh, A, Volume 6 at Tab 187. And at page seven of nine is a document which we looked at yesterday, attachment three. And uh, agenda item, and this is described as agenda item 6.1, is that right? Yes. Right. Now going back to the minutes at 6.1, which is the CEO report. Yes. As I put to you earlier, that says the CEO report was noted and taken as read. Yes. And the only description in the minutes about you speaking to that report were, as I've noted earlier, drawing the board's attention in particular to the disability sector market overview and to the NDIS revised 1 July 2019 pricing. That's all that's recorded in the minutes. Well, that's what the company secretary has recorded. It, you know the company secretary, is that right? Oh, I'm not. Who was the secretary at the time these minutes were taken? Um, I believe Mr. Campbell Headley undertook the minutes of these meetings. And uh, did you know whether it was the company secretary's practice in relation to taking minutes to record matters discussed at a board meeting of importance to the organisation? I believe he's a professional company tech secretary and a lawyer. And you can see on these minutes that the uh, chair has signed off on the minutes as a correct record. The, these minutes are, as I said, taken by the company secretary and the chair of the board approves the minutes. I'm not involved in the minutes. Uh, looking at the first page of the minutes, it says that the meeting went from 7.30am and closed at 9.50am. Yes. Do you have a recollection of whether the minutes were held, uh, or sorry, whether the meeting was held in person or on the telephone? I believe in 2019 it would have been held in person. And you stand by your evidence that there was a fulsome discussion about your report at the board meeting, do you? Yes, and it says that the board, my report was noted and taken as read. It says it was noted, but I do believe that there was a discussion about my report.
Now, uh, yesterday you uh, told the Royal Commission that the draft report that you prepared that had the subjective material uh, was altered or, I might put it this way, toned down because you got advice. Um, no, I don't believe it was toned down. There was a different type of report written that was considered to be more objective. I have thought about it overnight and I still can't recall where that advice came from. You still can't recall that? No, I did have a good think about it and if I knew the answer to that question, I would genuinely, honestly uh, give my, my truthful answer. Could this be the case that you made the decision to tone your report down because you thought it would be more palatable to the board to receive the report as it appears in the records for the board meeting rather than your true and frank opinion set out in your notes. Isn't that the case? Absolutely not. You wanted to shield the board from what absolutely might be not. bad news? No, absolutely not. I'm well known to be a person of truth and I speak my mind. And you wanted to shield the report from what were the obvious criticisms about Sunnyfield's role in the circumstances. Isn't no, that that's right? completely inaccurate. And what you wanted to do was to shift the focus onto particular individuals such as SP1, is that right? That's inaccurate. Why didn't you provide the board with a copy of uh, Ms Peord's uh, first draft? They were very detailed reports um, and they weren't provided to the board. They're very detailed reports. Um, they weren't provided to the board. By the 22nd of August, you'd had Ms Peod's first report and if you want to have a look at it, Commissioners, it's in Hearing uh, Bundle A, Volume 4, Tab 135. Ms Cutterhee, do you have a copy of that? No, I don't yet. Thank you. And do you, of course, recognise that as Ms Peord's first report? Yes. And in your witness statement, you've described the uh, process of the Peod reports being uh, prepared and how Sunnyfield engaged Ms Peord at paragraph 219 and following. Yes. Do you want to have a look at that? Okay, I'll go to 219. Commissioners, it's page 55 of um, Ms Cutterhee's statement, paragraph 219. You see, you've set out a table at 2.20. Yes. And that describes the eight reports and you've characterised them into the four different areas. Is that right? Yes. And at paragraph 221, you say, Sunnyfield engaged Ms Peord to investigate and prepare port report one directly. Yes. And that all other Peord reports were commissioned by Sunnyfield's external lawyers, Williamson Barwick, for the purpose of providing advice to Sunnyfield with respect to the issues concerned. So you say that? That's correct. So can I just, while we're on that paragraph, uh, why did Sunnyfield commission Ms Peod to undertake the investigation through external lawyers, Williamson Barwick? Why was that done? Because there were a number of industrial relations matters, um, particularly relating to SP1 and SP2, so that's why we utilised the services of Williamson Barwick, who later provided us advice in regards to their employment with Sunnyfield. But Williamson Barwick didn't undertake the investigation? No. And did you ask, or one of your staff, ask Williamson Barwick to uh, engage Ms Peord to do the investigation? Ms Peord had worked, I believe, previously from Williamson Barwick and was introduced to Sunnyfield, I believe, through Williamson Barwick. 
So there was a relationship between Miss Bjord, I believe, um, prior to this, um, and it seemed to be appropriate given there were significant industrial relations matters. Could it have... Commissioner, can I just um, ask my friend to clarify, the first report didn't involve William Bowen. That's what I've said. So long as that is clear. That's what she has said and that's what I've said. It's a case, isn't it, that the purpose of uh, Sunnyfield asking its external lawyers, Williamson Barwick, to engage Ms Peord is that she wanted to ha be able to claim legal professional privilege over the content of any reports that Ms Peord prepared. Isn't that right? I don't believe that that was the primary purpose, no. It wasn't the primary purpose? No, I don't believe so. It was mainly you're aware, aren't you, that claims in relation to legal professional privilege have been made in relation to those reports? Yes, I believe that was one of the purposes, but I'm not sure that it was the primary purpose. So you're saying it's not the primary purpose? Yes. As I said before, I believe it was because there were significant industrial relations matters that were needed, and Williamson Barwick specialised particularly in that area and have worked for Sunnyfield for a very long time. What were the significant industrial matters arising in relation to Report 8, which you know to be about the um, reports around Melissa and injuries to her? What are the industrial issues that arose for that report? Because they were also related to the staff involved. What I want to put to you is that what you sought to do was to use the external lawyers so a claim for legal professional privilege could be made and therefore all of the reports would remain confidential and not be able to disclose to anybody else. That was the purpose of seeking these investigations to be done through the lawyers. Isn't that right? Well, I object to that question. Um, it's already been asked, but in any event, it's unfair in circumstances where the sting in the question appears to be some criticism in engaging lawyers to deal with this issue. If lawyers had not been engaged to deal with these matters, there'd be a greater criticism, which was these matters were being dealt with in-house. So in my submission, the question is unfair. I haven't made any criticism. I'm just seeking to identify the fact. I actually don't understand the point, Mr Duggan. I'm sorry. What's unfair about it? Um, there's a suggestion that the retaining of lawyers um, to investigate these matters or to instruct an investigator to investigate these matters is somehow inappropriate. No, I think the suggestion may be that uh, the lawyers were engaged to do it in order to attract what is now known as client legal privilege. Yes to the documents as opposed to an alternative which would have been to engage the investigator directly in which case client legal privilege would not be attached. That's all that's being suggested as I understand it. Am I correct? No, not at all. I don't think that involves a, an unfair suggestion of impropriety. We'll wait and see what happens as far as the answers are concerned. Yes, would you remind please um, Ms Cutter here of the question you asked? I just need the transcript to come back in a way that I can read it. So this is my question. I want to put to you, what I want to put to you is, what you sought to do is to use the external lawyers so a claim for legal professional privilege could be made and therefore all of the reports would remain confidential and not be able, and not be able to be disclosed to anybody else. That was the purpose of seeking the investigations to be done through the lawyers, isn't that right? My answer to you, as I gave before, is the primary purpose was related to using the lawyers because this had significant industrial relations concerns regarding both of the staff and also quite a number of other staff who are mentioned in the report. The first report was not um, prepared through the law 
the engagement of the lawyers, isn't yes, that right? That's correct. And that report raised a number of very significant industrial concerns, did it not? And that then highlighted the appropriateness of utilising the services of Williams and Barwick, which we've utilised before, to conduct the rest of the reports. So was it the fact that what Ms uh, Piord found in her first report uh, caused you to want to have any further reports prepared through the lawyers. Is that right? No, that is not right. I've answered the question and the question, my answer still remains the same. Can I take you to Ms Piord's first report, which you've got there? And the purpose of her report, and she confirmed this when she gave evidence earlier in the week, was to review the anonymous complaint received by Sunnyfield from the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, verbally reported on Friday 21 June 2019, and in writing on Tuesday 25 June 2019, and to review information provided by way of a complaint lodged by Sophia, the mother of Carl. Yes. The purpose was not to do a, a light or limited desktop review, was it? It was a broad-ranging review. It wasn't a limited desktop review, was it? I need to go back to the other report and check exactly again what was there. It wasn't a limited desktop review, was it? It was a, a, a broad review. Well, why did you tell the board that it was a limited desktop review? I'd need to go and check that paragraph again, but there was certainly... Well, go and check it. Yeah, thank you. Let's go back. Um, tab 187. Page 7 of 9. There's a heading in the middle of the page saying investigation findings to date. Independent investigator J.P. Ord conducted a limited desktop review as, as, well as, as, as well as interviews with the two parents of the clients in question and other staff at the home. Yes. So it's as well as. But it, the purpose of her preparing the report was not a limited desktop review, was it? And it doesn't say that the purpose here was that. It says as well as interviews with two parents of the clients in question and other staff at the home. You have described it uh, to the board in your report as a limited desktop review because you were seeking to downplay... I object to that question because my friend... I is... haven't finished the question. Just wait, Mr Duggan, before you leap up. Yes, we'll finish the question and then we'll see whether Mr Duggan has an objection. Right. With respect to the reference to a limited desktop review, you told the board that because you were seeking to downplay Ms Piod's report. Isn't that right? No. no just a moment. Do you have an objection? I don't have an objection. Though. Thank you. Would you be good enough to answer the question? I did. The answer is no. And you never provided this report to the board, ever? Then this report was not provided to the board and there is opportunities for other staff also to provide, uh, provide reports. Why didn't you provide this report to the board? Because they were very lengthy reports and our board usually appreciates reports that are concise. And so this was to provide them with concise information. This is a report identifying what Ms Piord described in her evidence today as a crisis in the house. You heard her say that? In one specific service, there was a crisis with two, which related to the behaviour of two staff. And if, uh, going back to your evidence earlier this week around risk management and the responsibilities of the board, should the board have been provided with this report at the time of the 22 August meeting? We didn't provide it to the board at that time. Our policy, by and large, is to provide the board with a summation of those reports. We did do that. The board were briefed fully at the meeting. Um, that is a conjecture of what the board requires in terms of their papers. Did you ask for any advice from anyone on the board as to whether or not uh, they may be interested in a full copy of this investigation report? Our board always has the opportunity to ask for any information and we're very transparent with that information to the board.
Uh, do you know if any members of the board have ever read this report? Which report? The PIOD report, this first one. I couldn't comment on that. I don't know the answer. Do you know if, if it's ever been provided to any member of the board? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer. But it, it certainly would be available if anyone wished it. In terms of reporting lines, it was your responsibility to report to the board about matters of this kind, was it not? My responsibility and also our, our corporate, general manager of corporate. Now, um, I want to take you to Ms Piod's report at page 20 and the number at the top right hand corner is 0848. Have you got that? Yes. Ms Piord told us earlier in the week that with respect to preparing this part of her report, she simply recorded what uh, staff had told her in the course of her investigation. You, did you hear her give that evidence in the week? Yes. And uh, when you read her report, did you read paragraph 5 on page 20 and what staff were saying? Did you read that at the time? Yes, I did. And in terms of looking at what the staff said, there's no reference to Eliza at all here, is there? Not in this particular section of this report. There's no reference to Eliza in this report at all, is there? I'd have to reread the report, but there is in subsequent reports. So you say, we'll go to each of them and I'm going to ask each time for you to identify where Eliza is referred to in the reports. So the staff are not saying the reason for non-reporting is Eliza. She's not identified, is she? Not in this particular section of section five. And in terms of the response team, Ms Piord asked all staff about their understanding of the response team. Yes. And on the following page, she uh, reproduces what she was told. Yes. Now, you were aware when you reported to the board on the 22 August 2019 meeting that one of the issues for the board to consider was the response team and the reporting and complaint handling. You're aware of that? Yes. Did you not think it appropriate to draw the board's attention to what was happening on the ground within a house as to their understanding of the response team and what appears to be some uh, reservation about the response team? You didn't think that was important to report to the board? There's been, as I said, a fulsome discussion at the board meeting. Well, did your fulsome discussion involve uh, telling the board specifically the matters set out in paragraph six? I can't recall back now to 2019 exactly the conversation in that meeting. And she also sets out on page 21 the reporting incident and mandatory and she describes what the staff say. There's no reference to Eliza in this part, is there? No, it's in regards to incident reporting in under point seven. Then she records what the staff have to say in relation to behavioural support plans on the next page. And uh, there's no reference to Eliza, is there?
Would you like me to read each section through? Well, uh, I mean, I, you, you're the one saying they're references to Eliza. I understand. I'm working through it and I'm putting to you fairly each time there's no reference to Eliza. You haven't found a reference to Eliza yet? I don't know that she's actually named. I think it references her as a guardian in here. Well, where do you say that occurs? Uh, I don't know if it's this report, but I do believe that there is matters raised uh, to do with the culture of the house in one of these reports that relates to that. And certainly I'm aware staff have come forward and raised their concerns from a WHS perspective. It's not in this report, is it? may not be in this report, but I believe it is in one of the reports. Now, uh, there are some references to Melissa under the Restrictive Practices Authority and the medication policy, but I now want to draw your attention to page 27 to paragraph 11. Ms Piord says the culture at the house became disjointed and distrusting. The team had become segregated based on ethnicity. From the information provided and not verified by the persons of interest because they hadn't been interviewed, it would appear the house manager, SP1, has made racial comments which has caused distress to some members of the staff, coupled with a gossiping culture whereby each ethnic group feel that the other is picking fault with them and it is alleged this behaviour starts with SP1. You would yes. have read that? Yes, yes. And there's allegations uh, about the, some staff feeling bullied? Yes. But feeling bullied by SP1? Correct. Did you read uh, the insights and observations carefully? Previously I have done, but not in the last day or two. And uh, you would have seen, having read it carefully, that there is no reference to Eliza. In this first report, if that's what you say, that's correct. There is no reference to Eliza bullying or harassing staff, is there? Not in that section. And I do agree that with what was in that section. Now, Ms Piord uh, provided a later report uh, and a copy of that is behind tab 136. Have you read that report? Previously, yes. When's the last time you read this report? Uh, would have been... A week or so ago. Right. Can I put to you, there's no reference to Eliza in this report. Would you accept that? Uh, if that's what you're saying. And uh, you understood this report to be an investigation with interviews conducted with the staff at the house and interviews conducted with the client family members to consider the responses to the allegations provided by SP1 during both interviews on 4 October 2019 and in writing on 4 October 2019. And so Ms Peord has prepared a report of findings in relation to the allegations about SP1 mm -hmm. and to provide insights and observations which may assist with decision making in relation to outcomes for the house as a work site, the working relationship between staff at this location the staff and family members, systemic processes and any relevant issues that may impact on the investigation. That was the purpose of it. You see that? Yes. 
Now, um, in terms of the findings at page 41, there's a summary of the allegations that were sustained or not sustained. Yes. And uh, what was your understanding in terms of Ms Peord's conclusions where something was not sustained? Did you understand how she reasoned that? I believe so, or that she could not prove that that was the case. Did you give her any instructions as to how she should approach the question of proving allegations when the allegations concerned people with intellectual disability who may not be able to speak for themselves? No. I didn't. I didn't commission these reports directly. Now, in terms of um, Eliza, can I suggest to you that the only part of this report which could possibly be a reference to Eliza appears on page 30? And allegation 16 says, it is alleged you speak disrespectfully about client family members of clients swearing and calling them bitches. Which is inappropriate. And there's a, a reference there to a part, and I won't ask you to read it, it's not redacted in the material, to um, SP1 talks about family members of the client I have heard him badmouth Melissa's sister, Eliza, and Carl's mum, Sophia. He swears and calls them bitches. SP1 was saying it is a breach of privacy to give them incident reports and Sophia does not need to know all this information. That allegation was sustained. Can you see? Yes, and that's totally inappropriate behaviour. And can I suggest to you, to the extent that there's any reference to Eliza, that is the only reference in the report, and you'd accept that that is not an allegation of poor or inappropriate behaviour by Eliza, is it? No, it's not. It's totally inappropriate behaviour by SP1. Now, turning then to the systemic issues on page 43, No doubt you read this closely. I did, but it's several weeks ago and a lot has happened since then. And um, Ms Piord records interviews with the client's parent, Sophia, and Chen's parent. You're aware, aren't you, that there was no interview of Eliza with respect to this investigation? Uh, you're, you're aware of that? Stating that, yes. Mm -hmm. And that Sophia and Chen's mother, mm -hmm. Jenny Peord, concludes uh, lack trust. She says, this lack of trust manifests into the parents feeling the need to continually check up on staff and processes. Do you see that? Uh, which paragraph are you at, sorry? First paragraph, second sentence. Yes, yep. And in terms of continually checking up on staff and processes, that's the basis of you describing Eliza as querulant and bullying staff, isn't that right? No, that's not correct. Did it cause you concern that there was a lack of trust at that time where the parents were feeling the need to continually check up on staff and processes? Yes, of course, absolutely. And did it cause you concern that when the staff were interviewed, they were aware of the lack of trust and therefore that placed additional stress on the carers on a daily basis? Very much concerned. They indicate that they're scared of repercussions should anything happen with a client on their shift. And she says this type of culture can lead to either non-reporting of incidents or misrepresented reporting to cover up from another staff member. Now she identifies the cause of this to be with respect to SP1, doesn't she? 
and I believe that that is the case. And when she says the overall culture of the house seemed to be distrustful and divisive, that's yes. at the end, you understood that to be about the way in which SP1 had conducted himself? That is correct. When you read this, did it cause you to reflect on the way in which you had treated Eliza and the way in which you had formed the view that Eliza was querulant? I hadn't did it cause you to question that? There are a number of things this report questions. First and foremost... Just asking you simply, when you read that, did it cause you to question whether or not you had been fair in relation to describing Eliza as querulant or, as you said in your evidence yesterday, bullying and harassing? This isn't the only piece of evidence towards that. At I'm all asking times you whether we when you read... Are we being the, fair? I asked when you read this, did it cause you to reflect? It caused me to reflect deeply on the whole circumstances and that the whole circumstances were most inappropriate. Ms um, Piord makes some observations about recruitment and selection on the following page. Yes. And these um, issues were then the subject of two further separate reports looking at recruitment processes for both SP1 and SP2. Is that right? Yes. And she makes some recommendations. Yes. And um, to what extent was did you uh, act on any of these recommendations? Yes, we did follow the recommendations where, um, in the majority of all cases. Where would we find a record that showed us that with respect to each of the recommendations in this PIOD report, how those particular recommendations were addressed or implemented? I think there's a summary in statement 22 of my, well, uh, section 22 or question 22 of my statement. In your statement? Yes. Right. Now, um, you're aware, and I won't take you through all the PIOD reports, and you've described them in your statement, which I took you to earlier. It starts at paragraph 219. Now, can the Royal Commission take this that um, when you prepared your statement, you had carefully read each of the PIOD reports? I believe so. And that what you sought to do in terms of describing the subject matter of the PIOD, each of the PIOD reports uh, are carefully set out in your statement at paragraph 219 through to page 58, 248, sorry, 49. And there's also some further information, I believe, in the question at um, part of the question. It's number 22 at 401, paragraph 401. That's um, okay. That's 11D. All right. So these changes to the PIOD reports you've described at paragraph 401 and following. Is that right? I believe so. Okay. Now. I asked you earlier about who within Sunnyfield had been provided with copies of the PIOD reports and at paragraph 250 you set out who received the reports. Uh, yes. And uh, am I right in understanding from reading paragraph 250 that the board members never received the reports? Uh, they weren't specifically given to the board members. That's what it says there. And what I want to put to you, other than the two report, the reports that were done in relation to uh, unexplained injuries to Melissa, none of the reports comment on Eliza at all. I believe that they had, but uh, if you're telling me that your lawyers have all gone through that in some detail and it's not there, 
Um, that's my misunderstanding. What I want to put to you is, in fact, there has never been an independent review with respect to the merits of Eliza's feedback or complaints, has there? Um, actually, we did have a workplace health and safety review um, that was done at a point in time with complaints that we received from staff. And there were complaints that we received from staff um, subsequent after SP1 and SP2 left. Um, we've had further complaints. It's not what I asked you, is it? Oh, I'm sorry if I got your question wrong. That uh, Sunnyfield has never conducted an independent review into the merits or the or of Eliza's feedback or complaints. Um, not as a specific topic, but we certainly did do the PEOD reports. And the PEOD reports are not investigations into Eliza, are they? No, not specifically. They're no. not investigations into Eliza's feedback, are they? No, they're investigations. They are not the investigations in relation to Eliza's complaints, are they? No, they're in, the complaint was the NDIS Commission complaint. There has never been an independent review for Sunnyfield to ascertain from an independent person whether any of Eliza's feedback or complaints were unfounded? It wasn't a matter of to do with the, the, the actual complaints. The, I had always said that all the way along. We were very welcoming of complaints and feedback. It was the nature and the manner of those complaints. Well, well what was it about the nature of those complaints? Uh, well, the nature, it was the way in which they were done. What, by email? No, it wasn't just by email. There has never been an independent review as to whether the way in which Eliza raised her feedback or made her complaints was inconsistent with either any direction from Sunnyfield or any policy and procedure. Do you agree with that? That's correct, yes. And do you agree with me that when Sunnyfield refused to complete the draft action plan and the communications protocol, that it could hardly be said that the fault lay with Eliza in relation to following a particular procedure that Sunnyfield required. Do you agree with that? No, I don't, because we didn't refuse to complete that. We did not uh, refuse. We actually, in good faith, drafted it and tried to get that completed. And unfortunately, Eliza felt that that should then be suspended. So we would have been very happy to finish that document. That was not your evidence yesterday. Your evidence yesterday is, and it's recorded in the Ombudsman's, material to the Ombudsman's response, is that you didn't complete the protocol because you'd already decided that you are going to evict Melissa. I don't believe that's quite the case. What, that you didn't say it or it's not the fact? <clears throat> I believe that there always takes two parties um, and look, I don't want to have a dispute with Eliza. That's not what Sunnyfield's about. And we certainly don't <coughs> want anything that causes any issues with Melissa. This is a matter that should be resolved, and I think it should be resolved through mediation. You heard uh, Eliza say that she had commented on the draft and that she was open to the protocol, but she didn't hear anything more about it. That's right, isn't it? Well, that's what Eliza's perspective is, and I respect that. Now, I want to put to you that a review of the PEOD reports disclosed a house in crisis and needing urgent attention. Do you agree with that? That's correct. And at this time, did you visit the house? Uh, not directly at that time. I went in December of that year. What, when you mean not directly? You mean you didn't visit I didn't go until December that year. That's correct. Ms Eastman, um, I wonder if you might clarify. I'm not clear whether you're asking whether Ms Cuddehy accepts that's what the report said or whether Ms Cuddehy accepts that that was in fact the case, the um, house in crisis. Yes. Uh, earlier this week, Ms Peord describe the house as being one in crisis. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you accept from the nature of the view that she undertook and what you asked her to do that that is a fair conclusion yes. for her to reach? Yes. We had two staff who had acted totally inappropriately um, and created 
a very nasty situation that was uh, awful towards the clients. And at any time, did you accept responsibility for the house being able to get to this crisis point? I've always accepted responsibility in my role. And, and my whole reflecting, team has reflecting, accepted responsibility. I'm asking you. Yes. And reflecting back on it, what could you have done differently to have prevented the situation with SP1 and SP2 arising? I think there's a raft of um, matters that relate to the whole situation, that, which goes to, through to the recruitment. One is, yeah, goes back to never should we ever transition a house in such a short space of time. I'm just that's asking about not the whole of Sunnyfield, you personally. Yes, that's right, me personally. Mm. Me, if I Personally, if someone had said to us to transition a house in three weeks with such complex clients, uh, knowing that the staff would walk out, I think we should say to the other provider, we just can't do that, we cannot do justice to the client. So I think that is the beginning of it. I think that, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't know why in the police checks and the working with children checks, the uh, character of SP1 and SP2 was not uh, uh, brought forward. Uh, and there were, which we have now put in place, some omissions to do with being able to check someone's um, consistency of their CV and that, we're, that they're being deceitful. I think there are issues around the training of the staff. There is quite a significant um, a number of issues around that. And I think also uh, the communication channels with the families and establishing very clear communication channels and sustainable communication channels. I think that's very important. I think it's important in terms of what we've done now to remove the rostering. We don't have rostering done by our service coordinators. I think there's a lot of things, if you would like me to keep going through. Just that, I wanted to know what, personally what you would have done, you personally. What I would have done differently, mm. overseen, have a, a, a better sense of the whole situation. I don't think as an organisation we've ever experienced a situation like this before and um, having better knowledge of the uh, potential of what deceitful people can do and how those things could be avoided. Um, this has been a very big learning experience for me and the whole organisation. Are you saying this has occurred because somebody was deceitful? Yes. I think there's this is a very complex case. There are people who've been deceitful, um, SP1 and SP2, and committed um, unspeakable acts. Uh, but I think there are a broader range of issues um, in regards to creating a, an environment where there's bullying and harassment. Um, a decision was made to terminate both the employment of SP1 and SP2 and uh, do you recall whether you made the decision to terminate? I think you said yesterday you did. Yes. Right? And did you have to turn your mind to the reasons for the termination? Yes, because we had legal advice in regards to that. And uh, can I ask you to look at the hearing bundle A behind tab 150? Do you recognise that letter? Uh, yes. And uh, it's unsigned, but um, it appears to have been the general manager, people, learning and culture. That's, so that's correct. That's the person who's uh, notified SP1 of the termination, is that right? Yes. But you made the decision. Uh, she would make a recommendation to myself 
um, and based on that recommendation and the legal advice in this situation, um, then yes, I would make that decision. Now, in terms of the decision on the first page, yes, uh, you say you note that SP1 disputes the adverse findings and the ambit of adverse findings and the adverse findings have been validly and carefully made after SP1 was given an opportunity to respond to the allegations. It is evident to Sunnyfield that the investigator did not make adverse findings where evidentiary requirements for adverse findings were not met. So you say that to him. Mm -hmm. And you say to him, in relation to your assertions that staff complaints were concocted, vexatious, retaliatory, involved staff collusion, in the context where a staff member was being uh, performance managed, Sunnyfield considers your assertions to be without factual foundation. Yes. And that over the page, the decision was to terminate him for reasons of serious misconduct. Yes. <clears throat> and then the identified uh, misconduct is set out in subparagraphs A through to C, is that right? Yes. And they're described in this way, a breach of your duty to comply with Sunnyfield's policies, including its code of conduct, which includes requirements that you maintain professional interactions with clients and their families. See that? Yes. And the reference to the families, what included all families? Yes. And that included Eliza? Yes to respect our team and managers and be aware of and comply with the legislation and Sunnyfield's policies and procedures. Yes. That's a reason? Yes. And Sunnyfield's uh, resources including your work time honestly and effectively. Yes. A breach of your duty to comply with your good duty of good faith and fidelity to Sunnyfield and a breach of your duty to exercise reasonable care and skill. Yes. Uh, there's no reference to the termination being on the grounds of SP1 engaging any, in any violence, abuse or neglect of any of the clients. That's not a reason. No. Our legal advice was that based on the Peord reports, um, also given the uh, court cases, um, that this was a solid reason on which we could, um, without dispute, uh, progress the termination. And was that because you were concerned that there might be legal proceedings brought by SP1, for example, in relation to unfair dismissal? Uh, he actually did do that, yes. The Royal Commission is resumed. <coughs> yes, Ms Eastman. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Ms Cudahy, I uh, omitted to ask you one question that I need to ask you about the board meeting of the 22nd of August. So could you return to the minutes at tab 187, please? This is Hearing Bundle A, Volume 6, Tab 187. Thank you. I ask you to turn to page 8 of 9, and that in the top right hand corner the number is 3054. Thank you. Now, uh, there's a few questions just on this page and I apologise I, I overlooked this earlier. Now, in terms of immediate actions, there's five immediate actions identified there. Yes. And, uh, and I think yesterday you remember 
I asked you about the CEO briefing to the board chair on the 24th. Yes. And that's included as one of the uh, actions. It says a stakeholder communique has been developed. Do you know uh, whether that was a written communique and where the communique is? I'm sorry, I don't. Now, looking at each of the items one to five. Yes. Uh, there's nothing in any of the immediate action items that record providing support to Melissa, Chen or Carl, is there? The main support there, it's implied, but it should have been overt, I agree, um, is in regards to the staffing. Where does it say that? In or in... That security for, uh, the, for the house? replacement of the service coordinator, adequate staffing and support staff, putting that in place. That was uh, a focus on the staff, is it not? But that's critical for the clients. That is absolutely critical There's for no the There's no mention of the clients at all in the immediate actions. But that is implied, as I said. Well, how would you know it's implied? Because without the staff, the clients can't be cared for. But I'm just asking you that one of the immediate action items does not include specific support for the residents, does it? That is implied, as I said, in number one, but it could have been more overt. Uh, and there's nothing in the immediate action items to identify any support or communication with any of the family? Uh, no, it's not there in detail. It says a stakeholder communique has been developed but I'm sorry, I can't recall that. And they're certainly key stakeholders. And uh, in the note to the board, further down under service setting, you'll see the second last paragraph is where you provide a report in relation to ELISA. Is that right? Uh, yes. And did you prepare this part of your report? Yes, and I believe others contributed. And why was it necessary to include this when the matters that have been the subject of the PIOD report and the notifications of late June 2019 had absolutely nothing to do with ELISA, did they? Uh, the issues around uh, the complaint in 2019 had nothing to do with ELISA, but it certainly had something to do with the service setting in which the whole uh, scenario had occurred. And that's why you thought to include it? Yes. I want to be fulsome with the board. And at that stage, you're telling the board that the eviction still stands. And that's about a year after the eviction notice. Is that right? At that point in time, yes. Now, uh, as you set out in your statement, there were criminal proceedings in relation to both SP1 and SP2. Is that right? Um, that's my understanding. And you've addressed this at paragraphs 296, at page 69 of your statement, through to paragraph 302. Thank you. Have you got that? Yes, thank you. And this part of your statement is in response to a request to provide a description of any specific assistance and support provided by Sunnyfield to the residents of the house in the course of the 2019 police investigations yes. of alleged violence and abuse at the house and subsequent criminal proceedings. Yes. So can the Royal Commission be assured that everything that you wish to say in relation to the specific assistance or support to the residents is set out in paragraph 296 yes. through to 302. Yes. And if the Royal Commission is to understand what supports and assistance were provided, then they can rely on the matters set out here. Yes. And you can't think of anything additional that you want to add. Is that right? I think there's things we could have done extra in hindsight. You don't say that in this part of your statement, do you? No. Now, in terms of... Um, changes that have been made, the Royal Commission asked you whether there, any, there had been any significant changes made by Sunnyfield to its policies and or procedures in relation to preventing, identifying, reporting, investigating and responding to violence against 
and or abuse, neglect or exploitation of the disability service users following the reports of Jenny Peord and a description of what had been done with respect to changing any of Sunnyfield's operating policies and processes. That was questions 22 and 11D, and you've set those out at page 94 of paragraph 401. Yes. And is that the um, entirety of the changes that have been made at Sunnyfield? Uh, you've sought to, to describe them in full, is that right? I've tried to do so, yes. <clears throat> now, uh, the Chair asked you yesterday afternoon about the apology that um, you've made in your statement. Yes. And it's the case, isn't it, that uh, following the termination of SP1 and SP2's employment, that there was no apology from Sunnyfield to any of the residents in relation to SP1 and SP2's behaviour? Yes, and I regret that that, wasn't, that didn't happen. And there was no apology in relation to any of the family members? Yes, and I regret that as well. And you yourself have not personally met with any of the family members in relation to the events concerning SP1 and SP2 to apologise, have no, you? No, and I regret that also. You've actually never met or spoken to Sophia, have you? I've not met any of the families. I've met the clients, but not the families. Is the reason that you haven't met with the families on legal advice? No, not at all. You've chosen not to do so? No, not at all. It's not, I mean, in this particular case, I do regret I should have met with the families. Uh, but in terms of all our clients at Sunnyfield, I haven't met with the families of all clients of Sunnyfield. Has at any time uh, Sunnyfield sought to apologise for its responsibility in relation to these events occurring? Uh, only in this statement, and that also I regret. Is that because it took having to come to the Royal Commission to make an apology? I don't believe so. I think the Royal Commission obviously has been a major focus on this particular case study um, and with collecting all the documents, which, as you said previously, I've deeply thought about. But I think that um, that was an omission at the time, and I think understanding how to deal with such complex cases and the learnings from that have certainly um, been deeply impacted myself, our team, and hopefully will have benefits for all people in the future. Over the course of your evidence in the last few days, you've uh, noted and said on many occasions about things being complex. Yes. Are you using the word complex as an excuse? No. For inaction or failure? No, I don't believe so. It is a complex situation. The client's support needs are complex. Um, I think that that then drives complexity with regards to staff um, around their NDIS supports, training for staff. Um, there is a, a lot of interaction with specialists. Um, I think that the dynamic that occurred um, from SP1 and SP2 added greatly to that complexity and the breakdown in the relationship. Do you accept that Sunnyfield failed to protect Melissa, Carl and Chen from violence, from violence and abuse in their own home? Yes, I do accept that. Um, do you accept that there were warning signs or red flags about SP1 over a period of two years before his suspension and then termination? I think there were warning signs. Do you accept that Sunnyfield... Sorry, I'll put it, let me put it this way. With respect to those red flags, do you accept that there was a failing throughout the relevant um, management or supervision uh, lines in, in Sunnyfield to detect those red flags and act on those red flags? I think there were gaps, yes, in our systems and processes that unfortunately, well, more than unfortunately, but the deceitful people had managed to to um, optimise. And I think having systems and procedures that can't be reliant um, on one person and that have more verifications and checks is absolutely appropriate. 
Do you accept that Sunnyfield's perception about Eliza could have negatively influenced Sunnyfield's ability to detect what you describe as a con man and a man who intimidated and threatened other staff? Could you repeat that question, please? Do you accept that your perception about Eliza may have led you not to see SP1's conduct? You've described him as a con man. Yeah. I believe the relationship breakdown contributed towards this, yes. Do you accept that had Sunnyfield not labelled Eliza is unreasonable or querulant or a work health and safety risk or a reputational risk, that her feedback and complaints may have been handled better? Um, I don't believe that's the case. Um, <clears throat> a lot of effort was put into looking genuinely at the complaints that were raised um, and to genuinely look into those complaints. It was very hard to find the evidence that we were looking for to substantiate those complaints. Um, and the, as I mentioned before, the manner of the, manner of the um, communication um, contributed to a relationship breakdown, which was unfortunate, to say the least. Do you accept this proposition that if a person is perceived as unreasonable or querulant, and those labels are used to describe them on a consistent and ongoing basis, that that will enable the person to be characterised in everything they do as unreasonable and querulant? No, I don't believe so. I think some things, yes, but not all things. Are you aware that best practice in relation to complaint handling requires organisations to move away from any approach that labels or categorises people as difficult? Are you aware of that? I'm not, but that sounds very reasonable. And that the language used to describe people as either high conflict, high maintenance, vexatious or querulant are all terms that should be avoided. Are you aware that that reflects best practice? I'm not aware of it, but I believe some of those terms would be inappropriate. And those terms that focus on labelling the person as being difficult or challenging, rather than on managing how to respond to the behaviours, is where the focus should be. So oh. you move away from the label and you focus on the issue. And I believe that we attempted to do that, um, but not necessarily fully. Are you seriously saying to the Royal Commission that you attempted to do that? I believe we did. You attempted not to use the, the, those labels to describe her? I believe we attempted to work through the issues, as you had said, and then we attempted to work through those issues, but we didn't achieve that fully. Do you accept that once you call people querulant, vexatious, high conflict, high maintenance, that those expressions can negatively influence how other people perceive the complainant and how they might be dealt with. Yes. And have the reviews of your complaint handling procedures uh, examined the way in which Sunnyfields describes family members and describes complainants? Um, I'm not aware that we've made reviews of that and I'm not aware that we would call, we've had any situation where we would have ever called a particular family member quarrelant. Do you accept that Sunnyfield has not taken, if Sunnyfield had not taken a protectionist approach to its staff and had responded to the red flags rather than siding with staff over Eliza, that the violence and abuse could have been prevented? I think there are other factors in addition to that. I think that having a um, service coordinator that is the sole point or primary point of contact is, is risky. I also think the fact that we now have all of our rostering centralised and that there are other audit mechanisms that can verify and check on what's happening in houses um, has a huge impact as well. Do you accept that with respect to Melissa Chen and Carl's house that the 
incident reporting by staff failed? I do believe, unfortunately, that the staff, there was a culture there where the staff weren't reporting all the incidents and complaints, and do that is a grave misgiving. Do you accept with, with respect to this particular house that the supervision of key staff members was deficient? At that point in time, whilst SP1 and well, while SP1 was there, yes. Do you accept that the culture in the house was one of a failure to listen and respect? Yes. And that there was a failure to ensure that correct information was obtained in relation to those who were working on the ground and in the house? Could you repeat that again, please? You accept that there was a failure to uh, obtain correct and reliable information from people who are working on the ground or in the house? Yes. Do you accept that uh, many of the concerns and complaints raised by ELISA were directed to what was happening on the ground in the house on a day-by-day -day basis? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. Do you accept um, that there was a culture in the house of blaming others? I'm not sure that there was. I think there was a culture in the house where people, um, you know, there was racial divides, which is really terrible, and people became protectionist. Do you accept that with respect to this house that Sunnyfield paid lip service to valuing feedback? Um, I think that I wouldn't say entirely lip service. I believe that feedback was valued, but not all feedback. And do you accept that the culture in this house was that if feedback was valued, it was only feedback that suited Sunnyfield, but nothing difficult or hard for Sunnyfield to address. That's right, isn't it? No, I don't believe so. We did investigate quite a number of different feedbacks. There were incident reports. We investigated um, quite a number of issues and we did, you know, really try and look into the matters. Unfortunately, I think here um, we were very badly deceived. Do you accept that Sunnyfield, with respect to this house, only paid lip service to its values of being person-centred? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I believe that person-centred relates to um, our individual clients and working with our individual clients. And I truly believe that the staff who work there, other than SP1 and SP2, um, really uh, want to do and really focus on doing the best they possibly can for the clients. Do you accept that Sunnyfield put its reputation and its interests above the interests of the clients at the house? Um, I don't believe so, but I think that we could have done much better. Do you accept that the risk management model at Sunnyfield is designed to protect Sunnyfield's interests and protect Sunnyfield from liability rather than genuinely focusing on the interests and the needs of clients? No, I don't believe that's the case. I believe we have a very strong culture we, in terms of from a corporate point of view um, and I, we do have a, a resources dedicated. Our systems could be improved, that's for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, we do not ever feel proud of what happened in this house in terms of how um, SP1 and SP2 behaved. Um, you know, we could have done much better. Do you accept that there's a significant gap between what happens at the board and head office and what happens on the day-to-day -day basis within a home? No, I don't believe that's the case. Do you accept that Sunnyfield's operational model is one that operates in this way? Everything will be well, provided that the clients and their families are compliant and do things the way Sunnyfield wants them to No, do. I don't accept that at all. Do you accept that with respect to the communication procedures, with respect to this house, those who were responsible for respectful and appropriate uh, communication were not equipped to actually communicate in that style or manner? I think people were not equipped to deal with 
the volume and nature of the communication that occurred. And there are certainly gaps um, on behalf of Sunnyfield in communicating with the guardians. Do you accept as the CEO that you bear ultimate responsibility for what happened? I do, yes. And you've heard Sophia's evidence this week? Yes. And she described in her evidence about matters still being ongoing? Yes, she said that. And have you taken any steps to investigate what occurred in terms of Sophia's evidence earlier this week? Yes, I did. When did you do that? I did that on Monday. What were the nature of those investigations? Oh, Tuesday. My apologies. It was Tuesday. What were the nature of those investigations? They were in relationship to the vehicle. And uh, did you speak to Sophia or attempt to speak to her? I was speaking. I, no, I wouldn't do that. I, I Very respectfully, I felt that I should not speak to any of the families while this Royal Commission was on. It was expressed by them that they had concerns about potential retribution and respectfully I kept my distance so that they could feel quite comfortable in giving their evidence. So I, I, I felt that would be inappropriate. And what was the outcome of the investigations that you undertook? My understanding is that um, some uh, damage has been done to the van where that the plastic sheath on the, um, uh, for the seat belts is off, but also um, the lining of the van itself can come out. And I've asked our staff to please have a look at that. And because it's more than, I understand an OT is going to look at it, but it will most probably require the company that built the van, whatever brand it is, to also have a good look at the design of the van so that that can't happen again. Okay, so, that's, I, so that's an investigation into the van. So yes. you've done that? Yes. What about um, an investigation or any inquiries about Carl? Uh, that, that I did ask questions about how Carl's health and well-being as well, uh, and I was assured that uh, Carl was uh, well. Do you ask whether he sustained any injuries? Um, my understanding is that he didn't, but there was a behavioural incident that occurred. So your understanding is he didn't sustain any injuries? That was what I heard, but I could be wrong. I understood he went and had some beautiful Lebanese food, on a drive and then on a subsequent drive um, um, some behavioural matters occurred. That's what you were told? That was what I was told, yes. And uh, you haven't sought Sophia's... Um, As I you... said, I think it would be highly inappropriate for me at this point during the Royal Commission to speak to either or any of the parents because I understood that they were concerned about uh, any potential retribution and I felt that um, the Royal Commission should be concluded before I had any contact with anyone. Do you agree that Sunnyfield is still, to this day, taking a protectionist approach towards its staff and dealing with complaints or concerns raised by family members in a defensive way? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Do you accept that if there is a protectionist approach that that is not fair to the residents being people with disability? No, absolutely. I think that's not the approach to be taken. Do you accept that it's not fair to the families? Yes, yes. Do you accept it's not fair to the staff? Sorry, what's not fair to the staff? If you're taking a protectionist <coughs> approach towards the staff. Yes, it's not. No, it's not fair to anybody. The, the issue that Jenny Piord identified of that lack of trust with the families continually having to check and the staff feeling that they're constantly under supervision. That dynamic remains in the house today, doesn't it? I believe so. The frog is still boiling, isn't it? No, I don't think the frog is still boiling. I think there's still some dynamic issues in the house. Nothing further. Thank you. Uh, the commissioners might have some questions. I don't want to overlook that. Yeah. Uh, before we, uh, before I ask whether anybody other than Mr Duggan, and I'll come to Mr Duggan, has any questions, I'll ask first Commissioner Galberley whether she has any questions she wishes to put to Ms Cuddy. Um, thank you. I'm interested to go back to Eliza's statement, paragraph 68, um, that there were th there were two other providers that the IDRS found 
who could have come in and provided services. Um, and you said that would be impossible uh, because of rostering. Um, I don't altogether, I'd like you to explain that more because there, there are examples around Australia where there are different providers in group homes. So I'd like to understand Sunnyfield's policy on this a little bit more and why that option um, was rejected and that would have then respected um, the right to the home, to that being her home. So the separation of you as a provider from the from the residents would have been a solution to this. I mean, it would be very difficult in practice in a shared living home where there are three clients. Um, there is one staff member, I think, under the NDIS funding for the night shift, um, although we currently have two staff and the night shift. Um, but working out how to manage and staff um, appropriately to the NDIS plans with different staff in one house I think would be very, very difficult in practice. Have you explored that at all? Have you done research into that and asked through uh, asked other providers whether they've... Um, is it partly that you would then miss out on the SIL payment? Uh, no, I mean, the, obviously the SIL payment would be split between the providers because um, the SIL funding relates to each of the clients. But how to make that work in practice, I would think, is very, very difficult. But I'd be quite happy to uh, look look into that further. I haven't done any research myself, but that is something that could be looked at. Um, my second question is regarding gateway community housing, because you've now attempted to separate um, the residents from the service provision. So with this relatively new, new um, action, would that mean that there would be security in residence, that that would be the home and they would be able to stay um, and because Gateway Community Housing wouldn't be issuing eviction notices? Uh, Gateway is a separate company um, and so it has a separate board. Um, and yes, the idea of having that separate is so that there isn't a conflict between the SIL provider and the housing provider. So there would no longer be eviction notices? Um, well, they can be, um, I'm not suggesting in this particular circumstances, um, I, it's a, a contractual matter either for Gateway or a contractual matter for the SIL provider. But that if the SIL provider withdrew, that's not a withdrawal of the residents. That's so correct. gateway, yes. so th therefore um, the resident would be able to stay. Yes. And there'd be a new provider and it yes. wouldn't be you and, and you yes. wouldn't then get the SIL payment. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner McKeown. Uh, thank you, yes, I have uh, two questions. Ms. Kadahi, the first question relates to earlier in your evidence when you asked by Ms. Eastman about uh, whether on day one of your evidence, whether any of the senior leadership team have lived experience as people with disability and you said not to your knowledge. More broadly, can you tell me, do you have disabled people working in the organisation, not including the supported employment program? Do you actively recruit disabled people to work in your organisation? We do have some folk who with declared disability, um, but I believe we could have more. Okay, and just uh, the last extension to my question is then, do you contract, for example, people with intellectual disability to come in and provide the training that you mentioned earlier on human rights and the convention? Do you actively hire people with disabilities? We do have some staff, as I mentioned, who have a disability, um, uh, and we, you know, utilise a whole raft of different organisations. And as I said, and actually, Sunnyfield's very passionate about the opportunity to create more employment for people with disability. And we've actually just um, put into our board a whole strategy on how we can work to uh, increase training, development, 
um, staff members, having more staff members with disability, and also to help create employment options for people with a disability. So that is something that we really would like to progress. Right, thank you. My final question is, and it relates to the very last paragraph of your primary statement, 461 on the final page, page 106. I'll give you a second to get to that. Mm -hmm. And I'll read out the first sentence. Given that the majority of Sunnyfield clients, clients have an intellectual disability, while it, has, while it has been considered, it has been determined that most people with an intellectual disability do not have the capacity to be able to be involved in making legally binding governance decision. Can you confirm to me, is that Sunnyfield's current position that most people with intellectual disability do not have capacity to make decisions? Is that Sunnyfield's current position? Oh, it, not all of, uh, many of our clients have the ability to make many decisions. Um, so please, in terms of um, decision making, we support our clients to make decisions and choice about their life. That's really important. To be clear, you're saying that not all people with intellectual disability have the capacity. Is that your position? No. Um, all of our clients make decisions about their life. There are some clients where they may not be the, there. They may have a financial guardian. Uh, they may have somebody else who's supporting them in making those decisions. But it's very important that people have the, the right the choice to make decisions about their life. Um, it's, it's nothing about me without me. Okay, so do you want to clarify that paragraph or I'll take it on the record that what you just said is that, that's your position? Well, I believe that people should be able to make their own choices and decision and our clients are involved in those. There are situations, as I mentioned, where there are guardians who uh, contribute to helping them in those decisions. Uh, it will be based on the actual individual um, in regards to what supports in decision making they have. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, before asking Mr. Duggan, I'll ask whether any other parties represented wish uh, to make an application to ask Ms. Cutter here any questions. No, thank you, Chair. Nothing from New Thank you. Mr. Mr. O'Brien here. Okay, thank you. Mr. Duggan, do you have any questions? I, I do. I won't be too long, uh, Commissioners, but I do wish to ask some questions. Um, yes, go ahead. Th thank you. Ms. Cudahy, I want to take you uh, to the time of the NDIS complaint, 25 June 2019. Um, now, after that complaint was communicated to Sunnyfield, um, you've given evidence that the police were notified fairly shortly after? Yes. Um, the Ombudsman was notified? Yes. Um, and shortly after the notification by the NDIS of the complaints, um, SP1 and SP2 were suspended and they didn't return? Correct. Um, you gave some evidence yesterday that when the original NDIS complaint came in, you notified the chair and were providing regular briefings to the chair. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, does that mean that you would have briefed the chair in relation to the particulars of the NDIS complaints? Yes. And does it also mean that you would have briefed the chair in relation to reporting to the authorities I've mentioned? Yes. And the suspension of the two employees, the subject of the allegations. Absolutely. And would you have indicated to the chair or communicated to the chair rather the reasons for those suspensions? Yes. Can I take you please to your draft report to the board it was prepared initially for the 22 August board meeting and it's the draft dated 28 July 2019, which is bundle D, tab 154.
Thank you. Um, now, you were asked some questions, particularly about the passage halfway down the page, investigation findings. Do you see that? Yes. And um, the first paragraph under that heading describes the independent investigation in certain terms. Do you see that? The first paragraph, yes. Yes, and it includes references to staff bullying, racism, intimidation and so on. Yes. And where it says there um, it refers to the independent investigation, shows a pattern. Was that a reference, obviously, to the independent investigations of Ms Pjord? Yes. And the second paragraph under that heading refers to the investigation also found, and I assume, too, that's findings by Ms Pjord, at least. Correct, yes, yes. Um, were those matters... Um, the subject of your communications with the chair? Yes. Can I just take you over the page? Um, and you will no doubt recall questions about the boiling frog scenario. Yes. Halfway down the page. Did you yes. see that? Um, and there were various thoughts and learnings that are described there um, that were occurring to you, at least at the time of drafting this preliminary uh, note to the board. Yes, I did give it deep consideration. So w when you were briefing the chair on a regular basis in this period, as you've described, are those matters the sorts of matters that you would have raised with her? Yes, absolutely. I have a good working relationship with the chair and I'm very full and frank with the chair. Thank you. Can I... Um, I don't need to take you to this, but um, for those who do want to have a look at it, it's Bundle A, Tab 1, the statement of Ms Piord in these, before this commission. Um, I might just read you the critical paragraph, Ms Cudahy. It's page 3 of Ms Piord's statement. She says... Um, 6 August 2019, Sunnyfield advised to put investigation on hold. Sunnyfield instructed me via email to put the investigation on hold to ensure the police investigation into oh, sorry, SP1 and SP2 was not compromised. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Were you aware at the time, in early August 2019, that um, the investigation was put on hold so as not to compromise the criminal investigation? I be believe so. Um, the next relevant event, um, a week later, is the completion or the finalisation of the board report, which is at A. Bundle A. Webcast is mute. Seven. Can I take you to that, please? Before taking you to the document, and I do want you to see it in a minute, um, was there some sensitivity around the independent investigation given that there was a criminal investigation going on? Absolutely. We didn't want it compromised in any shape or form. And, and what do you mean by compromised? What were you concerned about? Oh, just that it need to be... Uh, Jenny Bjord need to be able to undertake her work independently, but also that it didn't affect the police uh, investigation um, and that it was done in a, a full and impartial manner. Thank you. Um, can I take you to that board um, report of 13 August now? Do you have that in front of 13 you? 13 August or 22nd of well, August? Well, the board meeting was on the 22nd of August, which is at the top of the page. Yes. So the papers go out one week in advance. Yes. And so if you see at the bottom of the page, bottom left... Yes, it's got 13th. That's when it was written. Yes. Thank you. Um, if I can take you to page 7, please. Yes. Um, and this is the final version of your report that went to the board. On the 13th of August, yes. Um, and there's the heading there, Investigation Findings to Date, and that's a reference to Ms Piord's investigations? Yes. Um, and 
you describe there what is what is occurring with the investigations, and then the next paragraph you say based on the current status of her investigation. Do you see that? Yes. And then it sets out a number of bullet points. Yes. You see those? Yes. Can I just ask you to hold hold that page and also pull up if you can Ms. Pjord's first report. Yes, which I is think. Bundle A, tab one three five. Thank you. Thank you. So the the first bullet point in the 13 August report refers to, and I assume that acronym and initials are referring to SP2? Uh, yes. P pulling, pushing, kicking or manhandling one male client? And, yes. And Carl's initials in brackets? Yes. Um, and can I take you to Ms Piord's report? Yes. Page five. Yes. And uh, there's a heading there for established allegations. Do you see that? Yes. And then it has particulars of allegations in a box, and then there's some alleged conduct about physical abuse. Yes. Uh, of a vulnerable person with a disability. Do you see that? Yes. And then it describes the incident. Yes. Can I ask, is that first bullet point referring to that incident? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Um, the second bullet point, inappropriate verbal conduct by SP2 directed towards Carl, um, is that a reference to the established allegation on page 8 of this report? Yes. Um, over the page, there's an allegation about mismanagement of medications. Uh, which page number is that, uh, Sorry, page nine. Yes. And does that line up, that established allegation line up with bullet point three? Uh, yes. Um, page 11 of the Peord report. There's an allegation of mismanagement of client funding discussed then in some detail. And does that line up with the bullet point about false reports of outings or incidents? Sorry, which one are you referring to? I'm just a little confused so here. Page 11 of the Peord report, halfway yep. down. Mm -hmm. And oh, yes. bullet point four. Yes. This, this was the one you may recall where... Um, Carl was taken out in the van. Yes, no, this is um, where it's mismanagement of the um, funding that should be going to his supports. Yes. Um, the next one is page 12. Um, of the Peor report, Al alleged conduct or actions when considered in context constitute a breach of staff ratios. Yes. Um, and that lines up with bullet point number five. Is that right. the case? Yes. Yes, correct. Um, and bullet point six, is that the allegation at page 13 of the Peord report, the bottom of page 13? Yes. Inappropriate verbal conduct. Yes. Um, and then the next two bullet points relating to unauthorised absences from the workplace yes. and failure to investigate disciplinary matters in the House, are they, are they the two allegation, established allegations at page 15? Yes, they are. Um, you've been asked some questions about the fact that um, your initial draft of this document contained um, some of your subjective thoughts on these incidents. Do you call that? Yes, I do. And the fact that um, 
This is a different description of the investigation. Yes. In this final version. Yes. Um, is it fair to say that what you're doing in this final version is um, using Ms Piord's independent established allegations as the basis for reporting to the board? Absolutely, yes. Um, were you holding anything back by referring to matters such as pushing, kicking and manhandling or inappropriate verbal conduct or failure to investigate or discipline staff? Were you holding anything back when you were saying those things? I don't believe so. Um, can I take you please now to the actual board meeting, which was on the 22nd of August 2019, which is at... Oh, this is the one that I'm not sure has a has a reference yet. It was handed up this morning. Do you have a copy of the board minutes? You have those now? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, the board minutes comprise a document which is uh, approximately three pages, apart from the fourth page, which refers to the close of the meeting. Do you see that? Yes. And there's some um, initial indications of who's present and apologies. And so really the, the substance of the meeting is, dis is recorded in about two and a half pages. Correct. Um, if you look at the top of the page, uh, it states that the meeting ran from 7.30am to 9.50am. Do you see that? Yes. Does it accord with your recollection that this meeting took approximately two hours and 20 minutes? Yes. Um, do I assume from that that this board minute is uh, nothing like a transcript of what might have been discussed at that meeting? Yes, our minutes are not like a transcript. Um, if it was a... Uh, an accurate record of what was said at the meeting, I assume it would be a much, much longer document. Yes, it's, it's um, not written in that style. Um, can I take you please to... How much longer are you going to be, Mr Duggan? Um, about five minutes. Very Dead. good. Um, perhaps ten. I'm always a bit out with... Well, let's try and keep it to five, shall we? Certainly. Um, can I take you to page three, item 6.1? Uh, there's a reference to CEO report. Do you see that heading? Oh, yes, it's out of order. Um, they must have changed the order of the agenda. Yes. Um, it says there in that first line that um, you spoke to your report. Does that accord with your recollection? Yes, I always am invited to do that, usually, by the, well, always by the board. And I think you've given some evidence that you gave the board a fulsome briefing about the NDIS complaints and your thoughts on the matter. Yes. Um, and does the fact that that's not recorded there in detail mean that those matters were not discussed at the meeting? Not at all. Mr Duggan, may I point out that this series of leading questions um, is repeating the evidence that Ms Cudvey has given. I'm not sure that repeating it will actually advance matters, but uh, we've got another few minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I, um, after those matters were discussed and your fulsome briefing was given, can I take you to 8.2? Yes. Which relates to the company secretary's corporate report. And you see there the second paragraph, the board sought assurance that internal risk management systems and reporting were operating effectively. Do you yes. see that? Mm -hmm. um, is there any connection between that assurance sought by the board and what arose out of your CEO report? There could be. I can't di directly recall, but there could be.
Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. There's one, to one matter arising. So, sorry, I didn't finish that sentence in relation to that document. I do have some other short questions. Oh, it's just because I'm an incurable optimist, All Mr right. Duggan. All right, carry on. I'll just put you on notice. I have a matter arising. Sorry? I have a matter arising from well, that I, question. Well, Mr Duggan said he hadn't finished. Keep going. Um, you were taken at some length to um, corporate risk policies. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, can I take you please to it's bundle A, uh, tab 164. Thank you. Um, that, that's not a corporate risk policy, I take it? Uh, this policy reads, um, the gentleman's just given to me, policy prevention of and responding to allegations of abuse, assault or neglect of Sunnyfield clients. Um, and, and who would be provided with that policy? Uh, the board would be provided with that policy and it's available to all staff. Um, the next tab should be a policy poster. Thank you. Um, where would that be displayed or who would get that poster? This poster is available, um, to my knowledge, in um, it's in every single house office. We don't put, <clears throat> we try not to put signs up in uh, residents' houses because it's their home and it would be inappropriate but it's in all of Sunnyfield's support offices, all of our day programs and all of our facilities. It's on our website and this is something that we um, are, you know, ensure that all staff are aware of. Um, the next tab is a document entitled Procedure Responding to Abuse, Assault or Neglect of Sunnyfield Clients. Do you see that? Yes, we, yes that's a procedure. And and is that something that's used for training or who would be provided with that? Oh, this is used for training. It's on our intranet. It would be available and for all staff. Um, and there is a much more detailed uh, work instruction. Um, and we have online training as well as face-to-face -face training. Um, and uh, what, what's the point of the procedure? What's it designed to mitigate against? Or well, one, it's first and foremost is to safeguard clients, but if there are any concerns that people have, to report them immediately. Thank you. Um, the next one is a more detailed um, procedure document. Can I take you to that, please? Uh, yes. How is that document used at Sunnyfield? Uh, this is really the detailed um, uh, in practice, uh, how each staff member fully understands their responsibilities. It's split out uh, in regards to children, which are particularly vulnerable in addition to being vulnerable people. Uh, also for adults, clearly what the response team must do and the reporting um, and the whole detailed work instructions around uh, how that operates. And that's a, a very pivotal document uh, in the organisation along with the policy and the poster and the training that goes for all staff. Thank you. And there's um, the next one is a brochure which covers the same issues. And then the one after that, there's um, phone number and uh, photographs and names of each of the response team. Uh, yes, and that's a 24-hour um, a day service. And, and there's a response team symbol. Do you see that? Yes. Um, a, a house by the look of it and an unhappy face. It is because we do have clients who are non-verbal and we've been doing training around that as a representation for people to report. Um, the, the next tab um, relates specifically to that symbol. Yes, that's correct. Um, ha how is it that that symbol is used? Um, it's a help for with clients who are non-verbal to help them in communication 
um, and education, and that symbol is there. Um, there's little printed cards with that are laminated. There's also on, um, you know, in our employment services in various areas, so that if a client would like to report, um, then they can use that. Uh, and even if they can't fully explain, then that would be um, brought to the attention of the response team. Thank you. And the last one is um, the shared living service document with the after hours emergency support line and various details. Who, yes. Who is that designed for? Um, that's designed for all staff in our shared living. We have a 24, so in business hours, there's easy to contact people, but um, overnight, uh, in the evenings, on weekends, these uh, there's rostered separate staff who take any call of any sort in regards to any concern from any staff um, and help assist to uh, address and triage that matter for them. Um, thank you. One last topic. Um, you were asked some questions about how often um, you visit the homes within your portfolio. Yes. Um, and I think you said um, there were four visits per year. At least, yes. Um, and when you said four visits per year, did you mean you visited one house each time you went on a I visit? I this. Um, she didn't give that evidence with respect. She didn't say four visits. She said she visited quarterly. Okay, she visited. Just, I think if Mr Duggan wants to ask about this, then he should go to the evidence that was given. Well, I, perhaps I can do it this way. Chair, um, can I understand how, how many times you would visit the houses per year? Do you mean visit the 48 houses? Yes. How many of those houses do you visit each, have you visited each year over what period of time, Mr Duggan? Well, there's um, annually, how many houses would you visit of the 48? Oh, I I'm, haven't counted that. But what I normally do is spend a day uh, going to visit houses. Needless to say, COVID-19 in 2020 was very limited, but I do go to the facilities. Um, on the date of the December 19, I did a full day visit out to facilities. Uh, and as I had stated before, each visit could be an hour to two hours. Sometimes I go and visit uh, houses on my way home from work, so it's in the evening when the clients are there and things are busy. So um, when I mentioned uh, a day, a quarter, that was an estimate on my behalf. And if, and if you visited houses on one day and a quarter, would, would you visit more than one? Absolutely, yes, of course. I would do a series of visits. Some days I've visited five houses in a day, um, joined them for various meetings, uh, caught up with the individual clients, uh, speaking with the staff, uh, looking at the presentation and the condition, um, and particularly noting uh, and talking with the staff and asking them about how things are going for them and if they're happy um, and what issues they've got on their mind. Thank you. Commissioners, I have no further questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Duggan. I think, Ms Eastman, you said you had a Just matter arising. Just one matter arising. Ms Cudahy, you were taken to the minutes of the 22 August meeting. Yes, thank you. And your attention was drawn to paragraph 8.2. Yes. And you're asked uh, some questions about that in terms of what was discussed. Yes. To those questions, right. Can I ask you to have a look at the document D19? See that document says board meeting uh, 659 22 August 2019. Yes. And agenda item 8.2 COSEC corporate report. Yes. And the minutes of this meeting describe you as a CEO and COSEC. That's right, isn't it? I'm a, I'm a backup COSEC. Well, I've just start asking you about the minutes of the meeting on page one. You're described as CEO COSEC. Yes, but I did not do the minutes of the report. Campbell Headley did the minutes of the report. And he was a consultant invited to the meeting, is that right? And he was a consultant company secretary, but he wasn't officially appointed by the board. 
but he did the minutes. I did not do them. Right, now, what I want to put to you is with, with respect to what is recorded in the minutes for item 8.2, the discussions recorded in the minutes relate to the report that I have provided to you, D19. That's right, isn't it? Uh, the table report was taken as read and noted. And so the discussions in 8.2 concern this report not your report referred to in 6.1. Is that right? Not necessarily, because the um, the board has taken the report and noted it, and then they've sought clarification um, and asked a series of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and they've gone on to ask other questions about the organisation's internal risk systems and reporting. Mm -hmm. So but the board to... is not confined just to discussing the reports that are before them. But what I want to put to you is with respect to reading 8.2 in the minutes, mm -hmm. that that part of the minutes relate to the document, which is D19. It may accept it would, that. It relates to D, uh, the report, but they also could discuss other matters at that time. Right. And you can't remember whether other matters at that time were or were not discussed. Is that right? No, they always do usually uh, raise a whole raft of series of questions but I can't tell you specifically because that is some time ago now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Cudahy, for uh, coming to give evidence. Uh, may uh, Ms Cudahy now be excused as a witness, Ms Eastman? Yes, thank you. In that case, Ms Cudahy, you're free to go as you wish. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attendance at the Commission. I appreciate that it has been a long cross uh, examination for you. Thank you for all your uh, assistance. Thank you, and I wish the Commission well in its work. I really do. Thank, Thank you, you Ms Cudahy. Thank you. Um, what is next? Uh, so the next um, witness will be Mr McNaughton from the NDIA, and we just think it might be helpful just to allow us to reconstitute the witness um, arrangements. You want to, to have... take a lunch and adjournment now and regroup uh, afterwards, or is it better I'd... to start Mr McNaughton? I'm looking around for those who assist the Royal Commission in the organisation as to whether we can do that. Yes? Yes, so if we have perhaps a, an early lunch, and could we resume at 1.20? Yes. Just a slightly we'll, shorter lunch so that we can get through the, right, the evidence we'll, today. We'll adjourn until 1.20pm. What uh, I know for all those unpredictable elements, but when do you think we might be finishing today? All right, I've got it. From this point onwards, Ms Bennett <laughs> is in control. So. It's very wise of you, Ms Eastman. Well, Chair, I'm leaving for the airport at 4.30, so we'll be done well before that. Um, so I, <laughs> I hope you don't have to leave in the middle of the question. No. All right, we'll adjourn till 1.20. Please, the question. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next witness is Mr McNaughton. Ms McNaughton, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, uh, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you. Now, Ms Bennett, who is uh, counsel assisting the Royal Commission, or one of them, uh, will ask you some questions. Um, thank you, Mr McNaughton. I understand there are two corrections to your statement. Uh, one at paragraph nine. If we can go to paragraph nine, I understand that you have 30 years' experience rather than 20. That's correct. And at paragraph 22, I understand the reference to July 2017 should be a reference to July 2019 at the end of the first line. That's correct. Thank you. And with those corrections, is your statement true and correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, and Mr McNaughton, your role is the General Manager, National Delivery of the National Disability Insurance Agency, is that right? Yes. You've held that role since January 2020? Yes. Uh, and... Can you tell us briefly what that role involves? 
My role looks essentially what I do is I help uh, oversee the management of the NDIA's National Service Delivery Network. Uh, so that's the participant facing work essentially of the agency. So all of the state and territory officers and state and territory managers report to me. Our national access team reports into me, which is where we make our access and eligibility decisions. And also our complex support needs pathway also reports into me. Right. Uh, and how long have you worked for the um, what I refer to as the NDIA? Approximately seven years. And what other roles have you held in that time? Uh, I've also uh, been a branch manager uh, previously when I first started in the agency of our full scheme design area. I was involved in the negotiations or supporting the negotiations around the bilateral agreements and the rollout of the NDIS. Uh, I was also one of the general managers who looked after part of the service delivery network. Uh, for approximately 18 months, and I've also acted as the Deputy CEO looking after our communication, market and government relations area. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to slow down okay. a little bit in your delivery. Yes. Um, our interpreters are excellent, but do need Thank us you. to speak Sorry. at a reasonable pace. Okay. Um, have you been following the evidence over the last few days, Mr McNaughton? I have, yes. Have you heard some discussion about uh, template documents used by Sunnyfield? in its transition to the NDIS? Yes, I have. Okay. And are you familiar with the provision of template documents by your agencies to service providers? Yes, I am. Right. I'd like to show the witness a document, and this was provided to us overnight by Sunnyfield. It's document 63A, which I trust is available to the commissioners, and uh, there should be a copy there on your desk. Now, this just, I... Sorry, can I just check? Commissioner Gelbley, do you have that document? Uh, have we made no. it? No. I'm very sorry if it hasn't made its way there, Commissioner. I, um, I, I'm not going to the content of the document. I'm just identifying it at the moment. We'll do our best to get it no. to you as soon as possible. Yes. I apologise, Commissioner Gelbley. Uh, this was provided overnight, and we understand that this was the template that was provided to Sunnyfield in that period of time. Uh, does that look to you like a template that was provided by your agency? The version that we would have normally provided would have had a bit more NDIA related branding, but the language looks like our document, yes. yes. Could I show you um, document D63C? D. Yeah, that's it. Is this the toolkit that you provided, that your agency, I should say, provided to service providers at the time they were providing the template agreements? Yes, that's correct. We did that in July 2016. Um, and the purpose of some of the commentary around the toolkit is to explain to service providers what was expected in relation to the use of this template. Is that right? Yes, it's a, it's a model template that providers could use um, as to draw up service agreements. It also has an explanation in there for participants about what a service agreement is and why we recommended their use. Is the explanation for participants the document at 63B? Sorry, these were all quite late provided. I'm <coughs> Extremely late, yes. The document at 63B was superseded by 63C. You can tell it's got later uh, decal um, and branding of the NDIS. So that document was at the time uh, provided, but it's been superseded by this document uh, in 2016. And so far as you're aware, were service providers free to depart from this template? Yeah, it was certainly just a guide. Um, council around what we thought would provide an easy English practical services agreement that providers could use uh, and also participants could use. Um, if you have a look at page five of D63C. Yes. Um, that identifies halfway through down the page, the, the paragraph starting, developing a service agreement is a collaborative process between the participant, any other person, and the provider. Is that your understanding of what these documents were for? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, 
So is it your understanding that um, service providers uh, should negotiate with participants in the in identifying service agreements? Are you talking about 2016 or now? In 2016-17, in the transition period, was it your understanding that participants and service providers should adopt the model agreement or were they free to negotiate? They were free to negotiate, but the importance of why we wanted to provide this guidance was because it was quite a new uh, part of the NDIS, so providing some practical plain English guidance for participants and providers was really important to us then. And today, does your agency provide template agreements? No, we don't actually provide any template agreements, but we do provide some easy English guidance for participants yes. uh, on our website around the use of service agreements. And is it part of your function to audit those contracts to see that they comply with the relevant legislation? No. Do you know where, if anywhere, that function lies? I'm not aware of that. Do you know if there's much variation in the terms of service agreements between providers? I'm not aware of that either, Council. Is it your expectation today that service providers will actively negotiate with participants in relation to these agreements? It's our expectations that a service agreement is a mutual document uh, on behalf of both the participant and the provider. It's about how the provider will support the participant with the management, implementation and services related to their NDIS plan, so absolutely yes. I want to move now to the way that the arrangements between a provider and the participant are structured and the question of conflict of interest. Now, is it the case, Mr McNaughton, that service providers are now expected to identify any potential conflict between the provision of accommodation and the provision of services? Uh, this will stray into the role of the NDIS Commission yes. in this space, uh, Ms Bennett. But um, certainly from the NDIS perspective, uh, we would we strongly prefer that we avoid any conflict of interest in the delivery of services and supports. Having said that, of course, it remains the choice of the participant as to which providers they do choose. Now, has it been a problem in, in the role that you've observed where the role of service provider and accommodation provider exist in the same company? It certainly would be our preference for them to have some separation. We have seen some examples where that has caused some issues. Um, we also have to be mindful that in some locations there just isn't the broader market yet, especially in some of those more regional and remote locations. Um, and But it does remain our preference that there is a separation, Ms Bennett. Yes. And I just want to ask about the nature of that separation. Is it a formal separation that is required, that a formal separation of the companies, or does there need to be a, a more actual separation in terms of management and...? I, I don't think Mr McNaughton said that it's required. Oh, no, sorry. I, is your preference, I'm sorry, that there be a separation in terms of um, company or personnel? Uh, it's not really uh, a strong preference either way from the agency. We just want to make sure that participants have choice over their providers in those settings. We've heard some evidence about the potential for there to be some difficulties with multiple providers in the one um, accommodation space. Has that been an issue that your agency has dealt with? No, in fact, we've seen some examples, and I think this goes to Commissioner Galbally's question before lunch, we've seen some examples where uh, there might be additional providers going into a civil setting because there's a specific capacity building support in a participant's plan, so a different provider might go in and actually deliver that support rather than the civil provider. Um, so there are some examples around that, I think that went to Commissioner Galbally's question before lunch. Yes. And have you had any particular difficulties with multiple providers? Uh, we personally haven't within the NDIA. Mm. Whether or not um, providers have, uh, I can't answer that. And it comes to something I'd like to discuss with you in a moment, which is about the identification of synergies in a group living environment, a shared environment. So before I do that, I'd perhaps just like to step back and set the scene about how supports are identified. Mm -hmm. So at a very high level, can you tell the Royal Commission about um, how appropriate supports are identified for a complex participant? So, Ms Benes, it starts with the basis of a planning conversation, so where our planners will work with the 
participant, their informal supports, their nominee, guardians to identify the reasonable and necessary supports that they require. We'll use all assessment information available to us. Uh, could be reports from treating practitioners, allied health professionals, behaviour support plans. Um, it could be uh, then we would work with the participant to identify also their goals and, and aspirations, an important part of the planning process. Uh, as when there is SIL involved, Ms. Bennett, we do ask for the SIL providers to provide us what's called a roster of care. That roster of care is provided to us. We assess that. We make any necessary adjustments to the roster of care. And we use that information to help inform the basis of the reasonable and necessary supports for that person, which forms their plan. All right, so just to step back, the roster of care might identify, for example, the number of support workers present in a house for each participant. Is that right? That's correct. So it might be assessed that a person needs one-to-one -one supervision in the home environment and two to one in the community. Is that right? That, that could be an example, yes. Yep. And I, I want to separate this for a moment from the case study we've spent days on. So any, um, I just want to speak in the hypothetical. So if you had um, three people in a home and there were those support requirements, it wouldn't be necessary for the SIL provider to have, well, it wouldn't be necessary for the SIL provider to have three people at all times, would it? Ms Bennett, that depends on the circumstances of all the individuals in the house. So we have to assess each roster of care and each individual's support, uh, and then we have to make the decisions based on that information. Is there any space for, I guess, synergies based on that shared living experience? When you say synergies, you mean, for argument's sake, if three people in the household need one-to-one -one support, do you have three people or two-to-one support? So what we do is look across the rosters of care yep. to see where those synergies, as you call it, could be made. It's especially relevant, Council, to do with active overnight supports, how many active overnights or what we call passive overnight supports we might need in a property. And what's the role of the service provider in making these estimates? So the service provider information is important because they submit that information as part of the roster of care. Um, we did some pretty significant reforms over the last 12 to 18 months around supported independent living uh, on the feedback that participants weren't involved in the um, development of their rosters of care. And we wanted to see participants and their families more involved in the rosters of care. Uh, and so now we strongly encourage that they, they need to be provided to us with participant input. And does that mean that all participants need to see um, the needs of other participants? No, 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 they don't see the needs of other participants. They see what their proportion is of the roster of care and their individual needs are within the roster of care. So. And so when you talk about them having input, it's input into their needs. And the question about how they interact with the needs of others will be separately assessed. Is that That's right? correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it might be, well, is there ever any feedback to the families or to the supported person about the why you've um, assessed it in one way or the other, having regard to the other people in the home? Yes, yeah, so we do that as part of the planning process. So the roster of care is but one input to the development of the plan. We, as I said, we assess the roster of care uh, and make any adjustments that we may need to. And then we use that information as part of the planning conversation we have with the participant with their uh, informal supports or their nominees. And so that's when we have that discussion about what reasonable and necessary supports will be put into the plan. And what's the relevance of the operational capacity of the service provider? In regards to, to which Supported part, Supported inde independent living rosters of care. Is there any relevance at all to... Well, the, well, they will provide input through the development of the roster of care once that's funded their responsibility is to then negotiate that implementation of the, of the uh, NDIS plan. But the roster of care will be based entirely upon the needs of the, the individual residents and the individuals? That's correct. And, and there's no relevance to the operational capacity of the organisation? It, it is What we're funding is the individualised supports yes. that every individual participant needs in that residence and the roster of care contributes to those individualised supports. Is it to the advantage of the service provider to maximise the contribution from the NDIS? 
Chair, we, we've seen a pretty significant increase in seal costs over the last four or five years. In fact, the average seal cost now, Chair, is close to $325,000 per person per year. That has grown from $203,000 per person per year in 2018. Uh, so it's been a significant increase. We used to run a process chair called quoting, where, this, where the providers would quote how much it would cost. We unpacked that about 12 or 18 months ago as part of our reforms, uh, and now we do a much more individualised system through the rosters of care and that assessment process that I was just talking about. But the roster of care is uh, prepared by the provider. It is, but it's not a quote for how much it's going to cost them to deliver. It's about how many hours of support the participant needs, and we assess that and we'll make any adjustments that we need to make. We don't accept the roster of care as given. We will make any adjustments that we need to when we look across the property. But in determining the amount of funding provided through the NDIS, presumably you have your own standards of what the care should cost per hour or per day or whatever the unit is. Yes, that's correct, Chair. So then what we use is our price guide to determine the hourly rate for those supports. You're absolutely right. And how does that hourly rate relate to the actual payment to support workers, disability support workers? Yes, yeah, so we fund then the hourly rate builds up into the reasonable and necessary supports into the participant's plan. The participant then has a, a plan that they'll talk to their provider about, often have a service agreement. And then the provider will engage the staff to deliver against that. What, what, what the provider pays their staff and so forth is up to them. It's out of, outside of my remit. There will be various award wages and so forth, of course. But that's really between the provider and their staff. Well, I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit because support uh, service providers can only really charge up to the amount in the price guide that your agency provides. Is that right? Registered providers, yes, that's yes. correct, Ms Bennett. And is there ever any reconciliation against what it costs the provider to provide that service? We don't do a reconciliation of that. We set the price guide yes. and then it's up to the provider to work within that. Because So any margin that the provider can identify or can bring about through the operation of efficiencies that's for the provider to keep, is that right? That would be my assumption, yes. So if, if providers can obtain something more cheaply than the price guide, then they're entitled to do that and to just keep an extra margin? Yeah, providers can't charge over the price guide. No, that's right. It, it only yeah. arises if they that's can right. identify it. It's a maximum ceiling. Is there any um, rural or remote... Um, loading in relation to those issues? Yes, Ms Bennett, there's, there's various loadings depending on remote and very remoteness contained in the price guide. Yes. So, uh, and I'm thinking here in particular of First Nations communities that might be further away. Are, they, uh, are there uh, additional amounts available for people who might be further away from supports that are more expensive? Yes, there is. In the price guide we do have yeah. loadings depending on uh, remote and very remote. I think they're 40 and 50 per cent, but I'd have to check that to be how many uh, people with disability receive SIL SIL support? We have around uh, 25,000 participants in the scheme chair who receive SIL supports. Um, we, uh, through the NDIS, pay just over $8.2 billion a year in SIL support. Uh, it represents about 27% of the total NDIS spend each year, so it's a very significant proportion um, for... 25,000 participants represents about 5% of the participant base and it's about 27% of our annual spend. Um, the supports that are provided in this way <coughs> are provided by the service <laughs> provider and you've indicated that it's a matter between the service provider and the participant and his or her presumably family or guardian, to determine what fee is charged provided it doesn't exceed the maximum. But then it's up to the service provider also to determine what 
staff are engaged and how much they're paid, presumably within award limits? Yeah, the, the individual staff member selection is certainly up to the providers, of course. Um, how many staff should reflect what we've funded in the plan, whether it's two for one, active overnights, as we call them, means a provider. There has to be a worker awake during the course of the night, so we call an active overnight. So they will need to be provided as per funded in the plan, and that's where the service agreement provides that good clarity between the participant and the service provider around what supports they can expect. If you discover, <clears throat> by whatever means, that a particular service provider is not providing a service as per the approved plan, what happens? Chair, what normally happens now, or what is the, the process now, is that uh, there's an escalation through to the Quality and Safeguards Commission, um, and Commissioner Head would be much better at answering that question than I. Um, if we hear that feedback through our planners, uh, or our support coordinators, we will escalate with this escalation pathways between us and the Commission to investigate that. If you've been following the evidence, uh, you will know that uh, Sunnyfield is said to be non-profit, but in fact has made very considerable surpluses in each of a number of recent years. How many of the 25,000 uh, odd have their services provided by a profit-making entity? Uh, I'm not aware of that exact figure, Chair. Sorry, I'd have to take that and I can get that to the Commission. Mm. We, we do have a breakdown, sorry, Chair, of all the registered providers by type, so we, we could get that information for you. Thank you. Now, you've spoken a bit about the um, assessment process within your office. So you obtain a roster of care from the service provider. Uh, it now has more substantial input from the families and from the supported persons. Uh, and then you assess that. Yes. Now, can you just tell us a little bit about that assessment process? Is this where independent assessor, assessors have started to be used, or is that a different process? No, we, we don't use independent assessments for that process yet. That's a separate process. Um, our, we have a specialist, um, SIL, Supported Independent Living Team. They will assess the rosters of care. Uh, they will check against other uh, issues such as public holiday rates, our support, um, other residents within the house to make sure there's no duplication. Uh, they'll make sure that the roster reflects behaviour support plans, those type of inputs. And then that assessment then forms into the development of their actual plan. Now, the NDIS is a market-based model. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Is it fair to say it's a reasonably artificial market? Not sure what you mean by the question, Ms. Bennett. Well, prices are an upper price limit is set by your agency. Is that right? We provide a price guide yes. to help inform NDIS providers around what can be claimed. They're registered providers, and what can be claimed up to that as a ceiling. That's a, that's a maximum ceiling, not the actual price everyone has to charge. And in a in a usual market, an individual who is buying the service or the product has an interest in negotiating the price of the product down. That's a fairly simple but mm -hmm. accurate way of looking at it. In this market, the person who's receiving or negotiating for the provision of services um, doesn't have that interest, do they? No, they don't, uh, although they can. Th there's a couple of ways that they could, could mm -hmm. do this. Well, one is participants who self-manage their NDIS funds. Yes. Do, are not bound by registered service providers and are not there, therefore bound by the, the NDA price guide. Um, so that that is, uh, we do see that n not so much in the SIL space, but in other spaces, therapies and alike. Mm -hmm. um, quite often people will, in fact, about 31% of participants self-manage part of all of their plans, which gives them more flexibility to use providers who aren't registered. Uh, and that means they're not bound by the NDI, uh, a NDIS price guide. To the extent that service providers are in use and the price guide operates, you'd agree it's a, it's a different kind of a market, perhaps I can put it that way? Yes, in, in, in regards to that, we've got a price guide about what maximum prices can, can be used within, within the NDIS plan. And if I can suggest to you a lack of incentive to negotiate those prices down. Lack of incentive in whom? In the participant. 
depends, uh, Council, on the support type. So some participants will um, shop around, for example, for a piece of assistive technology. So they might want to find a similar piece of uh, assistive technology at a cheaper rate to give them more flexibility to use their other parts of their planes in other ways. All right. Um, and how often are a person's needs um, renewed? Uh, sorry, are reviewed? Yeah, Ms. Bennett, at, at the moment, for the most part, we do what's called annual plan reviews. Mm. Um, we're moving away from that uh, uh, based on feedback from participants, uh, especially where participants got quite stable uh, plans and supports and informal supports and uh, are being good consumers now of their NDIS plans. So we're moving to longer plans, two or three year plans, but doing more periodic check-ins with people to make sure that they continue to access their supports, working towards their goals, spending their plans well. So uh, we are moving to longer plans. Um, so two or three year plans are now becoming quite common. And is that, um, is that a model you're going to move to across the board? Yes, yes. Uh, in appropriate cases. In a, exactly, I was going to say that, Ms Bennett. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you about um, accommodation funding. Uh, I believe this is referred to as SDA funding, is that right? Yes. Can you tell the Commission very briefly what SDA funding really is? So SDA funding, if you, um, sorry, use the acronym, but it's uh, Specialist used to be Accommodation, I'll use SDA. Um, throughout the development of the NDIS, it was recognised that a proportion of participants, because of their uh, level of function and high support needs, will need an, uh, an accommodation solution. Uh, we expect around 29,000 participants at full scheme uh, over the next couple of years will, will require SDA supports in their plans. And a good way to distinguish it is SDA is the bricks and mortar of the house. And SIL or assistance with daily living or personal care supports is the support a person receives in the, in the actual there are several different um, types of SDA properties, depending on the level of function. So we have um, increased livability, uh, high physical support, robust. There's a number of categories that we have. And then we look at the design of the house. Is, is it a, an apartment? Is it one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? And then when the location of that house or property would be. So there's three sort of variables which then help determine a price. We put that price in the participant's plan each year and that funding then goes uh, to the SDA provider for the housing component of their plan. And is, is that able to be done in the private rental market? Um, not the private rental market. Uh, I can come back to the rental market, but this is actually uh, usually where an SDA provider will build a property or a set of properties. We will fund a proportion of that through the participants plan via the SDA amount yes. year on year. The participant might also do a reasonable rent contribution. And then on top of that, we fund the care the person needs whilst they're in the residence. I see. So SDA providers will build these homes and there are some that are already built. And is it fair to say they were built by state governments at the time when they had responsibility for these issues? Yes, Ms. Benner. There's a lot of what we call legacy properties, yes. which are the traditional group homes. You might have heard that language. Uh, we're seeing much more contemporary SDA properties now starting to emerge in the market, which is good. Um, there's still more to be done and more to go. We, we have about 15,500 participants at the moment with SDA funding in their plans. Um, the majority of those are already in a uh, SDA property through the Legacy Group Home Arrangements. Um, but we also have around 1,500 people who have SDA in their plans who are waiting for an SDA property to become available. Well, that was my next question. So um, what can a participant do to obtain accommodation if they have SDA funding? They're entitled but the bricks and mortar aren't there, what option does that person have? 
Ms. Bennett, we do a couple of things around that. Each quarter we publish what we call SDA supply and demand data. Um, so we break that down to a statistical area that says how many participants have approved SDA in their plans by location, by type. That signals to the market where we need more supply to come on board. Um, so that's really important for us. Um, there is also a uh, matching platform that we link to on our website. It's called the Housing Hub and there's one called Nest. And that's where all existing SDA properties are advertised and promoted. And participants can actually log on to that and create a profile for themselves about what they're looking for and where and you know, it becomes a matching platform. Um, so those things are really good, really good emerging sort of matching platforms. We'd like to see more of that. Um, and we'll continue to try and stimulate SDA growth by publishing that data over the, over the coming months. If I decide that I would like to invest in uh, properties that uh, are eligible for SDA funding, is it necessary for a, any proposal to be attached to a participant who gets SDA funding, or can I construct these dwellings myself and in some way get support from the NDIS to do it? There is a chair, there's a registration process, so the property becomes registered but there is a lot of private equity going into the SDA market at the moment, uh, which, is, which is a good thing as well in terms of... But is that independent supply. of any particular participant being attached to the property? Yes, yeah, so, so Chair, yes. Um, what, they, what we're doing is signalling where we're going to require SDA properties, where then the market are responding to that signalling, they're building and then we're, the matching can occur later on. Um, there's been some, Chair, also there's been really good examples of um, SDA providers who have identified a participant who might be uh, suitable for one of their properties being built and that participant is then engaged in the build, the design, colour selections, tile selections and things like that. So we've seen some really good examples of that emerging as well. And the remuneration or income that the developer, if I can use that term, derives is from the annual payments that are made by the resident, which in turn are funded through the SDA process. Yes, that's correct, Chair. It's, it's the SDA component of the plan. Uh, as well, they might also charge a reasonable rent contribution on top of that. Yes, thank you. And that reasonable rent contribution is generally capped at an amount that's equivalent to a percentage of the disability support pension, is that right? That's right, Ms Bennett. Generally, it's 75% of the disability support pension. Yeah. And that will all go to the SDA, can, can. go to the SDA provider, can, yes. at, along with the um, SDA payment that's part of that person's plan? Yes. Okay. And when you talk about matching between the SDA provider and participants, is there also need, need to be a third person in that um, relationship that is a service provider? The service provider for the SDA component or the care component? For the care component in the hand. Y yes, that, that often comes postscript, if that makes sense, Ms Bennett. So we identifying the house is an important thing because it might need to be constructed. Uh, and then as that gets close, close to construction, uh, the support coordinator or the planners or the local area coordinator would be working with the participant about the care needs they may have with either themselves or their other tenants in the house. I see. Um, now, in the case study we've heard about over the last few days, um, as I've understood it, uh, Melissa had SDA funding um, after the enrolment of the house in which she lived. Now, if she wanted to modify other accommodation, she would need to secure that accommodation first. Is that right? Ms Bennett, it's probably a good point here to talk about home modification separate from right. specialist disability accommodation. Home mod modifications are a really important part of the NDIS. They're different to S specialist disability accommodation. We don't actually modify an SDA property. We traditionally modify someone's private home, uh, which is, provides another great opportunity for people to stay in their, their houses. And we've seen some wonderful examples of someone 
potentially um, a good example that I've heard of recently, someone who's got um, motor neurone disease. Um, we've been able to modify their house. We paid home modifications as a one-off payment into their plan. They're able to stay in their home with their care package. That is not SDA. That is separate to SDA. And so does a person who requires home modifications, they need to have a home first before they can obtain funding for those modifications? Traditionally, yes. Yeah, so it might be their own home. It might be the parents modifying the home for a child who has a disability. It might be a person who has a new diagnosis or a new uh, acquired physical in, um, disability that we've, we're doing some modifications to their existing home or they're purchasing a home and we can do some modifications to assist with that too. Is the cost of that kind of home modification included in the figure of $8.2 billion that you mentioned earlier? No, Chair, that's separate on top of that. That's separate again. That yes. How much is that? Uh, I'd have to get the figures for you on home modifications each year, but we do have that figure, Chair. I'll have to get that for you. Is there a degree of circularity there where a person can only access the modification funding after they have the accommodation and they can't obtain the accommodation until they can guarantee the funding for the modifications? Probably depends, Ms Bennett, in the situation. Sometimes we've got people waiting um, for a home modification. They're in... A, they're in could, could, uh, an example is um, part of our uh, work at the moment on young people who live in residential aged care. Mm. Some people are able to return back to their family home uh, with some modifications and, and support. So there, there are some examples like that that we're doing at the moment. But genuinely, we do require, obviously, the property to modify and that to be locked in uh, before we would fund the modification. Um, so what about someone who doesn't have a home? Is there a category of funding for that person? Ms Bennett, it's, it's a complex interface with homelessness services, state and territory social housing, the role that they play, uh, as well as uh, what the scheme, what the NDIS is there. The, the NDIS is not a homelessness service. Mm -hmm. The NDIS funds uh, the reasonable and necessary supports for people with disability. The role of homelessness services is that of the state and territory governments um, who are responsible for community and social housing and public housing. Uh, we certainly have a lot of participants who reside in social and public housing, so we, we will uh, obviously provide the supports they need whilst they're in those um, public and social housing settings, as well as um, people who are in the private rental market. So there's a, a range of different housing options for people, but it's not the NDIS's role specifically to solve homelessness, no. And there's no funding category for people with a disability uh, to obtain housing uh, if they can't source the stock it themselves? Other than what we've been talking about in terms of SDA um, and home modifications, that's, that's our role in terms of housing. Uh, our role is more broadly then around the supports a person will need while they're in their accommodation options. Do I gather from what you've said that home modifications can be applied to social or public housing? Chair, there is some guidelines around that because um, state and territory systems are required to make reasonable adjustments to their existing stock. Um, uh, so that primarily relates uh, to the responsibility of state and territory systems. Uh, but there are some exceptions where we may need to do some more. Uh, we tackle that on a case-by-case -case basis. We can also do modifications in a private rental but again, we need to look at the certainty of tenure and how long the lease agreements are and uh, value for money propositions and, and those so, sorts of things. So things. part of the uh, cost of modifying accommodation <clears throat> for people with significant disabilities who require modifications to their accommodation, part of that is borne by the state and states and territories? That's correct, Chair. Yeah. This is a complex system, isn't it? There's there's lots. It, it, it is really important. It's a good question, Ms. Bennett asked, because quite often people with disability who are at risk of homelessness, people expect that's the NDIS's role. Um, where in actual fact, the, the, there are agreements through mainstream interface agreements that the, the state and territories are primarily responsible for social housing. Uh, we're responsible for reasonable and necessary disability supports for that individual. So. Um, this may be a little tangential to what we've been talking about, but I'm rather intrigued by the notion of private equity 
going into the construction of dwellings that might be used for people with disability because they get their return, if I understand your evidence, from the support provided by NDIS uh, through the SDA, SDA program. But private equity, if that's the right expression, private investment, needs to weigh up returns from this kind of investment against returns from the general housing market. How, do, how does the NDIS fit into that competition of markets, if you like? Oh, Chair, I'm, I'm not going to speculate around the, the veracity or value of equi private equity investment, but um, it's, uh, it, it is something that we see quite a bit of emerging in the SDA market, and for us that's, that's good because it increases the supply. Um, but, but, it we, does we certainly... imply, but it does imply, doesn't it, that the economic return from that kind of investment is comparable with the economic return from investment in private markets? I, I would assume that would be the case. That's what You're we're not seeing an investment. I'm not an economist, Chair. Yeah. Nor, nor am I. <laughs> nor am I. Um, so I, I wanted to explore that we've been speaking about eviction a lot the last few days. So take a hypothetical scenario where a person with very significant needs, um, who perhaps lacks capacity to enter into agreements on their own, is evicted from their supported independent living home. And they're dropped at a hospital and the service provider drives away. I stress this is hypothetical. Does the NDIA have any role to play in relation to that person? Ms Bennett, there's, there's two, two points I make here. One is the SIL providers um, have a practice guide, uh, a, pr a practice um, Standard, I think it's called. Commissioner Head will be better to, to um, explain this. But there is, there has to be a reasonable transition period for those sorts of events to occur. You might ask Commissioner Head that question um, to avoid the situation that you've talked about. Um, but where we do um, find out of a cessation notice or a notice for eviction, certainly we have a role to play. Uh, with our planners, our support funded support coordinators, to start exploring alternate um, accommodation for that participant. But um, you, you know that we've put in some safeguards to to have a reasonable transition period to allow for us to do that work. And a reasonable transition period presupposes <coughs> that another service provider will step in. It, it, um, it provides time for us to find and secure alternate accommodation. I guess that's the intent of that period. Yes. And really my question is directed to the expiration of that time and when the service provider says, I'm entitled to now take possession of the room that I had previously licensed to this person, what is the role of the NDIA? The NDIA's role, first and foremost, would be the, the well-being and safety and secure housing of the participant mm. and to try uh, everything possible to make sure that they are able to find appropriate alternate accommodation. Uh, and that's, that's what we do. Uh, that's what we do with our support coordinators. We would be working with other providers, uh, emergency accommodation providers. There is, there is often other sorts of um, emergency type um, uh, short-term accommodation options that we could use whilst we're securing a longer-term accommodation. But, so these are the sorts of things that we would do, but um, we try and avoid those situations by having reasonable transition periods. So, so is there a category of crisis funding that relates to accommodation? It's not crisis funding as such. Usually what we can do is use the funding that exists within the participants plan already, use that flexibly, there are two um, other types of funding available. One is called short-term accommodation and one's called medium-term accommodation. We can use those if uh, there is uh, an emergent need to do so. Uh, usually we've secured a long-term arrangement and we need to uh, find a short-term accommodation arrangement while the long-term placement becomes available. And so does the participant need to apply for a variation to their plan and be assessed against your criteria in order to access that funding? 
Miss Ben, if they don't have that funding already in their plan, we would need to do a plan variation to put that in. And is there a process by which that can be expedited? Yes, we, we, we call it an agency initiated plan review and, and we do those things quite regularly in, in such circumstances. And what's the usual turnaround time on applications of that kind? Oh, where, where there is an immediate crisis, um, those things are, are literally done intraday uh, within it. If it's a standard plan review, they, they would take a longer period of time, but when there's urgent crisis situations, uh, they're done usually very quickly. All right. Um, I'll ask you a few questions about um, about training requirements, and I understand that there is, for, for someone to be, or for an organisation to be a service provider, um, well, there is an NDIS orientation worker training module, is that right? Miss Bennett, these are all um, questions probably directed better at Commissioner Head, uh, who manage those worker screening, worker training credentials. They're not part of the NDIA's remit. And so you don't have any oversight into how um, the people providing services are trained or any of those no, matters? No, that's the role of the Commission. Is there funding for training of people providing supports if upgrades are needed? Uh, but you'll have to ask that to Commission. I'm not sure. Sorry. Not, not yeah. through your agency? No. Yeah, right. All right. Um, no, Commissioner, those are the matters I wanted to explore with Mr. Thank you. Today. Uh, I'll just ask uh, the other commissioners if they have any questions. Commissioner Galbally? Um No, that's... Uh, thank you. Commissioner McKeown? No, thank you. Any uh, council have any questions that they would wish to put? Nothing from New South Wales. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing else? No, thank you. No, thank you. In that case, thank you very much for your attendance. Yes. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. You're, yes, hello. Just a couple of questions, please. A couple of questions. Yes, all right. Sorry. Does the NDIA do any form of case management? Sorry, are you near a microphone? Um, there's one here. Yeah. You've got one. Okay. We certainly recognise in the NDIA that... Uh, some participants require a lot more intensive support and coordination and connection. Um, the model that we employ within the NDIS is called our complex support needs pathway. We introduced that in late 2018 and progressively rolled that out uh, nationally in 2019. Um, the complex pathway uh, is a model where our planners have a higher skill set, higher qualification, uh, and experience level. They manage a caseload of around 60 participants each and they work really closely with the support coordinators, the families, their nominees, uh, to manage those interfaces with the NDIS, uh, with other service systems, could be health, mental health, justice. Um, and they really work with the support coordinations around capacity building, access to supports and ultimately helping people achieve their goals. So that's the model we currently employ. We also have a network of liaison officers who work in the justice and health settings, uh, who also support participants who have more complex needs because they're in and out of those settings at times. Um, and also within our complex team, we had a, a team of dedicated planners who support uh, our participants who are currently residing in residential aged care. Um, so that, that's the current model of how we, we support, a more, provide a more intensive support offer, offer councillors. And that's called CSN pathway rather than case management? Yeah, we call it the complex support needs pathway. Thank you. Um, and what if a participant does not have a family member who can help them? What happens then? So, Council, where, where we identify that a participant needs support with their decision making, I think it's also really important that one of the pillars of the scheme is that the participant is assumed to be able to make decisions and should be involved in their planning, should exercise choice and control. Uh, but we do realise some participants will need assistance with that. For the most part, that's provided by their informal support networks. Uh, we have the to appoint a nominee 
a nominee can then uh, be uh, assume the sort of rights under the NDIS Act in terms of planning and plan reviews and decision making. If the person doesn't have informal supports or a nominee in their life, then traditionally uh, the state would appoint a guardian or a trustee who would assist them with that. Um, and then as well as that, there is a network of disability advocacy services who can also support people with disability funded through Commonwealth and state programs, not funded by the NDIA. They're independent of the NDIA, obviously. Uh, but there, there's another way in which people can access support through advocacy services. What, what did the advocates do? So the advocate, advocacy services will help um, the participant with their dealings with the NDIS. Of course, they might have dealings outside the NDIS that advocacy services can also help with, um, whether that be with Centrelink or banking or other health or medical um, areas, uh, of course. But advocates often do support participants with their dealings with the NDIS. So helping them in planning meetings, planning decisions, decisions over service providers, uh, those sorts of activities. Were there advocates in 2016 and 2017? It was my understanding that they were, they were there. They, were fun, they, they remained funded by other portfolios, n not the NDIS, so I can't comment too much on, on how much goes into that sector. I'm not across that. Sorry, Council. I have no further questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms Downs. Nobody else? Thank you very much for your attendance. and. Uh, <coughs> you are free to come or go as you wish. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. The next witness is Mr Graham Head. I'm happy to... Do we proceed straight away? I think Mr Head is here. I think I saw yes, him in the distance. If he's comfortable to do that. Mr Head, if you wouldn't mind coming forward uh, <coughs> to our notional witness box and... Uh, if you would follow the instructions of my associate who will minister the affirmation, a process with which you have become no doubt intimately familiar. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr Head, for coming yet again to the Royal Commission. Uh, and uh, now Ms Bennett will ask you some questions. Thank you, Mr Head. Um, uh, you've made two statements in relation to this hearing, one dated 30 April 2021, is that right? Yes. Um, and if I could... I understand there's a correction. Paragraph 29. Paragraph 29, thank you. Uh, that it ought to read the 10th of August 2018, not the 9th of August. That's correct. Thank you. And with that amendment, is that statement true? Yes. And you've made a second uh, and supplementary statement uh, dated, I lost the date, um, 23 May 2021. Uh, and you've got no corrections to that statement. And that statement is true and correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr Head, I'd like to ask you about complaints generally. But first, can you tell the Royal Commission what your current role and responsibilities are? Uh, I'm the Commissioner for the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, which is a Commonwealth uh, entity that uh, commenced operations uh, on 1 July 2018. Uh, it has progressively taken responsibility for the regulation of quality and safeguarding in the NDIS from states and territories. Uh, in three phases, New South Wales and South Australia in 2018, 1 July 2018, everyone else bar Western Australia in 2019 and Western Australia joined the scheme in this quality and safeguarding component of the scheme on 1 December last year. Thank you, Mr Head. I'd like to ask you some questions about complaints about service providers. Now, I'm going to ask you these questions by reference to today. Yes. And then I might ask you some questions about 20, an earlier period, 2017 to 2019. But when I do that, I'll let you know. Now, as it stands today, anyone can make a complaint to your commission. Is that right? That is correct. And have you heard the phrase, no wrong door? I have. Is that a phrase that has a particular significance for your organisation? Yes, it refers to... Uh, 
essentially ensuring a simple process given that uh, the making of a complaint can be stressful or people can be unsure about where to go. No wrong door is intended to ensure that wherever people come, if it's not the right place, they are assisted to go to the right place. And so what might be an internally complex organisation is to the participant simple. That's they come the... to the door and they explain their complaint. Is that the way it's meant to work? That is the way it's meant to work. Yes, thank you. Um, does a complainant need to have evidence before they come to your commission? Uh, no, they need... Uh, I mean, obviously, with a complaint, uh, we need some information to act mm. on in order to be able to examine the complaint, but it is not the case that people uh, require evidence. We frequently receive complaints where people have some general observations to make that allow us to pose the right questions to the right people and elicit information uh, that may in fact become evidence of a problem. And is an example of that that a family member might come to you and say, uh, my non-verbal family member keeps having bruises that I can't explain, is that something you would be able to take and investigate? Uh, that is something we could take as a complaint. With, with no more? Um, well, we... Uh, would obviously need some sense of uh, who was being complained about information to help us understand uh, what may have happened. Uh, may that be connected to the provision of NDIS supports and services because uh, uh, our complaints function is connected to the provision of NDIS supports and services. So obviously we need sufficient information to allow us to take the next step, um, but not detailed evidence uh, of the matters at hand, although through the course of a complaint we may seek further information on things. The reason I ask is there is, of course, a, a cohort of quite vulnerable participants who might be unable to explain, for example, where injuries came from. That's your understanding, isn't it? Yes. And family members might be able to observe bruising and they might have suspicions but might be able to put it no higher than that. And I'm interested if that's enough for you to take action. Uh, subject to those other things I mentioned, so being able to identify the participant and therefore draw an inference about where a problem may have occurred and who might be the subject of the complaint. Uh, uh, you know, with each complaint circumstances might be connected both to NDIS and non-NDIS related matters. So our complaints officers go through a process of establishing whether they have the information they need to, to go the next step. Um, and so is that part of the clarification process or is that after you're in an investigation? That's part of receiving the complaint initially, trying to understand whether or not uh, the Commission uh, has jurisdiction for a matter? Is it a complaint about an NDIS? Uh, is it a complaint on behalf or from an NDIS participant in relation to NDIS supports and services? Um, do you have processes to make sure that your commission consults as much as it can with people with a disability? Uh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about those? So um, it occurs at a range of uh, levels, both in terms of, uh, uh, you know, at the sort of policy level, we have formal consultative mechanisms with, uh, with uh, organisations representing people with disability and uh, we do quite a lot of work with advocates. At the operational level, depending on the matter that we're... Uh, dealing with uh, many of our complainants are themselves people with disability. Uh, some of our complainants would be family members, some friends or other loved ones, some uh, workers. Uh, there's a range of people, advocates who are well known. And so through the course of a complaint, depending on where the complaint comes from, the nature of the complaint, uh, there 
may be direct involvement with a participant. There may also be direct involvement with an advocate or sometimes with family members. And does your commission adopt the trauma-informed approach to those inquiries and those discussions? Uh, we're building our capability in that area. We, uh, one of our uh, new operational leaders uh, who has a background in, uh, in this area is looking at the Commission's expertise in, uh, in this area and yes, we, uh, we are building our capability in that area. So you're not where you'd like to be yet, but you're building to it? Well, the Commission's in the third year of a massive transition from what were profoundly different arrangements that existed in states and territories. So I think in terms of both our own capability and practice and experience, we are building all the time, not just the size of the organisation, which is also growing, but the range of expertise that we house internally but also for those areas where there are gaps in uh, our internal expertise. Uh, for instance, if we require particular assistance around something that intersects with a complex medical uh, matter, we have a panel uh, uh, that we've recently established in terms of clinical advisors to assist in matters where it would be difficult for the Commission to have its own dedicated expertise, but where it may need to uh, access that expertise. Are there any other significant gaps in your internal expertise at the moment? Well, I didn't describe that as a significant gap. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry, I didn't mean to imply that. Let me put that another way. Are there any significant gaps in your internal expertise at the moment? Uh, I think the Commission uh, has broadly the capability across its functions that uh, that it needs to have. We have quite a lot of, we put quite a lot of structure into our recruitment processes to ensure that uh, we're build, building a mix of skills and experience, not just in the disability sector, but also more broadly in the use of regulatory tools. And one of the unique things about the design of the Commission when governments agreed to, uh, to the establishment of the national body is that we have a clinical area ourselves. So we have a senior practitioner and a group of experts in the organisation whose area of expertise is in behaviour support and the issues associated with behaviour support. Do you have, do you seek to recruit people who identify with having a disability? Yes. Uh, and do you have any statistics on how many, how many people in your workforce identify in that way? The most recent statistics would have come out of our um, uh, workforce census last year. Um, we're, we're required to publish data in our annual report each year. Um, it's, not, it's not the case that I have uh, up-to-date figures at the moment because we've increased our staff by uh, around... Uh, or in, in the process of increasing our staff by about 110 positions, which is a, about a 30% uplift. But I think, and I'm uh, happy to provide the accurate uh, answer uh, after this hearing, but I think in the last census, the proportion of people identifying as having a disability in that census was above 10%. Returning to complaints, um, does an NDIS, does a service provider need to be informed about a complaint before you take action about it? Uh, in the complaints process, we uh, uh, would typically, uh, well, some of it will depend on how the, uh, how the complainant requests that we handle a complaint. So there may be circumstances where a complaint is made where people request confidentiality and that may allow us to go so far in the process. Um, but we would typically work with the complainant to, uh, uh, I guess, develop a shared understanding of how far we can go without actually raising the issue with the complainant. And, uh, and that, of course, uh, affects our capacity down the track in respect of the choice of actions we might take in respect of a complaint. Do you often hear from participants concerns about retaliation from service providers? From time to time. Yeah. Can you 
Is that a common concern that you hear? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a common concern that I hear. Uh, and sometimes it's a concern based on experience in the past, you know, where people, where the regulatory systems in states and territories were quite different. Uh, we have, there are arrangements in the NDIS legislation to uh, uh, guard against uh, wrongful action being taken against people uh, raising complaints, but I think it's uh, fair to say that these arrangements are new. I mean, in Western Australia, they're only less than a year old. Um, and what we're often dealing with is a long history of whether or not people have had confidence and trust in the arrangements they've dealt with. And they're also dealing with a new organisation where most of our people have come into a new organisation, the Commonwealth only recently regulating in this space, and they're not dealing with an organisation where people have been working in a stable, bedded down system for 15 years. So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, dimensions of our work which are about ensuring that we develop consistency of practice internally very quickly to make sure that that confidence and trust is able to be built with people who are coming to us. Is retaliation something that's difficult to identify? Um, well, it would be difficult in some circumstances and not in others. Uh, I know from previous roles I've had uh, related to protected disclosures in the public sector workforce that, which of course have very strong sanctions against, uh, uh, re uh, against uh, retaliation that you sometimes see examples in that environment or that are quite easy to identify and others that are more covert. Uh, a lot of our work uh, is to actively encourage people to speak up. And that's not only participants or their families, but to encourage advocates, to encourage workers, in fact, to encourage people more broadly in the community because uh, in environments where there's greater transparency, uh, more connection between that environment and broader structures in the communities, you're less likely to have the conditions in which re uh, retaliation uh, can occur. All right, now we've talked a bit about complaints and I think in your statement you, you talk about um, investigations being carried out either internally or independently. It's a paragraph 111B of your statement of 30 April. I just want to understand a little bit about how these investigations work. So what would trigger an investigation of that kind? Um. So 11B is uh, referring to, uh, sorry, uh, paragraph 111 is referring to reportable incidents uh, where uh, our role uh, under the legislation and uh, uh, the Act and the associated rules is to oversee the, uh, the management of uh, an incident by the provider where that provider has been required to report certain things to us. So one of the things that we are able to do uh, in respect of reportable incidents is to require the provider to undertake uh, an investigation, either an internal vest investigation or to require them to appoint an independent party uh, or, or somebody with specific expertise. There are examples, for instance, where in relation to incidents, we have wanted independent verification of the well-being of people and have required a provider uh, to, uh, for example, in one case, uh, appoint a registered nurse to do uh, direct uh, well-being assessments with clients uh, in a particular service. So in the independent investigation that you're talking about, what are the characteristics of independence that you require service providers to obtain? Well, uh, in reportable incidents, we, we may require um, a provider 
to, um, to undertake an internal investigation or we may uh, require them to appoint a third party to undertake that investigation. And as I've said, uh, we may specify a particular type of expertise and what, and what we will be looking for to be covered uh, in the material that's provided back uh, to us by the provider. So let me let me start again. Is there um, is there a requirement of independence? What is what is part of the requirement of independence the investigator has to have? How far removed do they have to be from the service provider? Well, the rules don't uh, specify that. Typically, I think in our experience with the reportable incidents. Uh, uh, when we're asking for an independent investigation, we're asking for a third party, i.e. Not, uh, not the staff of the organisation, and we specify uh, the expertise that we're looking for. We, uh, as far as I'm aware, have uh, not typically specified who a provider uh, can go to. Uh, we're looking for a third party uh, examination. Um, that's in respect of investigations. Of course, third parties are involved in other parts of the regulatory framework because of the way the auditing uh, process works. And just focusing on in independent investigations for a moment, can such an investigator be a former employee? Uh, well, I wouldn't encourage that, but I don't think there's... Uh, uh, we would typically, when we're communicating to a provider about... An, uh, uh, a re requirement to undertake an independent investigation, we would be indicating that we're interested in an objective assessment of certain matters that we're interested in. We don't micromanage the way the provider uh, meets its obligations. Its obligations are to uh, comply with the requirements that we uh, place on them, but we don't uh, manage their obligations in respect of responding to our requests, obviously. And can a service provider engage the same independent investigator as many times as they like? Um, there isn't anything specific that would, uh, uh, that would preclude uh, an organisation from engaging the same investigator. There might be, uh, and I'm speaking hypothetically here, if we had uh, experience with a provider and raising matters uh, with a provider and felt that uh, either there was a non-responsiveness uh, in respect of certain matters and that included an unhappiness with the quality of material that we were asking to be produced, we may uh, indicate uh, but that's not a. Uh, I'm not saying that that uh, has been uh, the practice. Um, the commission is a relatively new organisation, and it, um, with many organisations that have been required to do uh, investigations, some of those will only have been in the commission's jurisdiction for a relatively short period of time. And so, is there any reporting to you about, for example? the annual spend a service provider might have with a single um, investigator? No. Is it conceivable that a high yearly spend could impair the independence of the investigator? Uh, I would think that... Uh, I mean, there are general obligations uh, around integrity, uh, transparency and honesty under the Code of Conduct for providers as well as practice standards that relate to governance and management, I would have thought that an organisation uh, in its own governance processes would be uh, concerned uh, around those things, those areas of practice that might mean that work they were relying on uh, may, that them, there may be some unmitigated uh, risk or conflict in all of that. But we do not monitor the spend of an organisation on those things that relate to their governance obligations. So in a sense, you, you're relying upon the probity of the service provider to safeguard the integrity of the independent investigations. Is that fair? 
Yes. Uh, and then it seems that you rely on the, on the independent investigator to tell you if there is a problem with the integrity of the service provider. Is that fair? Well, I would make the observation that under the, as part of the registration process, uh, your, uh, I think uh, I've provided uh, evidence uh, in a number of witness statements on the practice standards, on the approach to audit in the supplementary witness statement here. There are, of course, uh, parts of the core module that relate to organisational governance uh, and uh, quality indicators around the sorts of things that uh, auditors look for. So there is a general assurance process around governance and audit. And registration is a once every three year process uh, for these sorts of providers, a certification process that also includes a midterm review. One of the uh, critical objectives for the Commission in terms of its core functions is to drive for continuous improvement and that of course includes things that relate to the governance uh, of organisations that are providing supports. And it's a condition, there are conditions of registration that relate to uh, uh, a provider uh, responding to requirements uh, that we place on it for information. Uh, there are penalties for providing us with uh, uh, what turns out to be uh, false information. So there are a range of things in the registration requirements as well as the audit process that are not unconnected from governance and assurance. Uh, and Mr Head, I, I take it that the Commission has to deal with many different kinds of providers, both for SDA and SIL. Yes, I think... Uh, well, can, they would include, apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, service providers that operate for profit, service providers that are non-profit, or at least that's their constitution, There'll be small providers, there'll be large providers, there'll be providers that operate on a national basis and providers that operate on a state or more local basis. So far, am I right? You're absolutely correct, Chair. And of course, in the, uh, in the NDIS, there are a significant number of sole traders, particularly allied health professions. Does all of this present challenges in terms of... Uh, monitoring the performance of various categories of service providers? Well, I think the... I mean, you would expect that in a, an emerging uh, and evolving market for something as new as the NDIS that there will always be challenges. I think from the point of view of a national regulatory body, there are some challenges that are about the, uh, the structure of the market, as you've just outlined, but... Uh, I think a feature of this first period for the Commission has also been the extent to which those bodies have been regulated in the past and the form of that regulatory practice. It is not the case that we are migrating into this national system. Providers who have been regulated in the same way in each state and territory, both the comprehensiveness of the arrangements but also the form in which the arrangements were applied differ dramatically. In some states and territories, you didn't really have much statute-based uh, quality and safeguarding arrangements. You had the funding body, uh, funding block-funded services, having as a, in a sense, a schedule to the funding agreement, certain quality and safeguarding arrangements that uh, that providers would have to meet. I, I don't underestimate the difficulties in making a new system work uh, and the challenges that you would have been faced with during your term as the Commissioner. But I'm wondering about institutional changes that might, in a sense, make the job of the Commission easier, but more importantly, provide a safeguard for the provision of services to people with disability who were often, as we have heard, without a voice themselves. Does it strike you as odd that a large service provider, whether non-profit or otherwise, could be governed 
by a board that has no people with disability and a senior management that has no people with disability? Well, I certainly think that the practice standards encourage the involvement of people with disability. In but they don't always work, do they? Uh, well, they don't put uh, specific requirements in terms of you know quotas or targets or anything. They encourage involvement, and uh, and I uh, see examples in the sector of organisations responding uh, well. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that uniformly organisations have not responded, but on the basis of the evidence that we've heard about Sunnyfield over the last nearly five days, there does, say, there does seem to be an organisation that has a board with no people with disability, whether it physical or intellectual, uh, nor does it have a senior management team consisting of 10, according to the last report, that have any people with disability. And I'm just wondering that insofar as there is a connection between people with disability involved in the management and structure of an organisation and the quality of services that they provide to people with disability, whether there is not room for some kind of uh, constraints imposed from above as to how these organisations ought to be structured and how they should be, how they should be governed. Well, I certainly think it's the case that the Commission takes the view that maximising the opportunities for people with disability to be involved in the governance of organisations that are providing supports to people with disability is a good idea and that the practice standards and the work that we do would seek to see that evolve in the sector. Yes, I'm not seeking to be critical of what's being done to date. I'm just wondering whether there is room for something more prescriptive as far as at least large providers of services are concerned to ensure, not merely encourage, but to ensure that there is a meaningful contribution of this kind from people with disability? Well, there, there could indeed. I mean, I don't prescribe the arrangements for no, boards, I, but I think uh, I I've seen in a range of different areas very lively debate about how to deal with issues where the lack of diverse experience on, on boards has a range of consequences for people interacting with those organisations. And I think it would be uh, a good thing to see that same uh, uh, conversation occurring uh, uh, in this sector. Thank you. I'd like to just return to independent investigators for a moment. Um, are there any registration requirements for independent investigators? Uh, independent investigators, uh, we register service providers, so uh, we don't register the range of uh, expert, uh, unless somebody being contracted by a provider is being contracted in respect of the provision of NDIS supports and services, we don't regulate what those people do in the same way that if a provider was to engage a human resource consultant or indeed a legal practitioner, we don't register those people. We register the service providers, uh, not... Uh, uh, and through, uh, I guess, the full uh, raft of our regulatory tools, uh, workers, people employed by... Um, uh, uh, service providers in the provision of supports and services are subject to our uh, regulation. But if a provider engaged uh, uh, an investigator or some other kind of professional service to assist them with a function, we don't register those. No, and that, that investigator could be anyone, couldn't it? For your purposes, they need only be not an employee of the service provider well, and they will be sufficient for your purposes to provide an independent investigation, is that right? We don't determine uh, that's, the, that's, that's correct. Yes. Um, and there's a degree of reliance upon the reports provided by independent investigators, isn't there? Uh, I, think, I think it might help to make that a bit more specific. Reliance by whom, for, for what well, purpose? The circumstances in which an independent investigator is engaged is in response generally to a reportable incident. Is that right? Uh, yes. And it might be that you 
the Commission requires an independent investigation to be carried out in relation to that incident. Is that right? Yes. And then you will confirm that an independent investigation has been carried out and has reached a conclusion. Is that fair? Yes. And you won't go behind that in independent investigation report to confirm the factual findings that are contained within it. Is that right? Um, I, I don't think that last uh, element would be correct. And I think there are the example I referred to earlier, for instance, uh, around well-being checks. We specified very carefully uh, the type of uh, professional we wanted to carry uh, out those checks uh, and uh, looked very closely at how those checks, uh, how that process of checking uh, had been done. So there are ways, uh, if we were interested in very particular questions being examined, we would indicate what they were and we might indicate the form of expertise in order to be able to not just ensure that the work is carried out but to make a judgment about whether that work it was assisting us to uh, to effectively oversee the providers management of that incident. So, so why do you require providers to carry out an independent investigation just so I understand? Well as part of the reportable incident uh, function uh, the, you know, the nature of certain incident, incidents which may suggest that there's been misbehaviour um, uh, by an employee uh, or uh, something where it would be, you know, of that sort where it's more challenging for an internal investigation to, uh, to deal with uh, matters, we would request an independent investigation. And why do you make that request? What do you propose to do with the report that comes from it? Uh, to determine how effectively the provider, uh, whether the provider has managed the incident in a way that deals with things that we're interested in. So was the participant first and foremost, uh, uh, through the management of the uh, incident, was the participant or any other participants uh, kept uh, safe? Um, uh, were matters that require uh, referral to the police referred to the police? Were actions that should have been taken in respect of workers against whom allegations have been made uh, taken? So the reportable incidents function is a function where uh, you would be aware that under the NDIS Act and the associated rules, Provide, registered providers are required to have an incident management system and uh, they are required to report a subset and specified uh, set of uh, incidents to us as reportable incidents. And our involvement in the process is to oversee the way they manage that incident. And there may be incidents where, in addition to the matters I've raised, uh, issues emerge that may prompt us to uh, uh, separately uh, investigate and to take compliance or other action. Mr Head, would there be merit in having a panel of uh, investigators who would be required to be certified by the NDIS QSC and uh, where an independent investigation is required, a selection is made from that panel but not by the service provider itself? I haven't given that uh, uh, a great deal of thought. I have worked in regulatory systems uh, in other domains in environment, uh, in environmental regulation where such things have existed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it is certainly something that could be examined, but, but in truth I have not. No, During right. the establishment phase of the Commission looked particularly specifically at that question. No. Um, I have in mind that uh, I would accept what you say, that uh, most service providers will be well-intentioned, competent uh, and anxious to provide the best quality of service. But whenever you have a range of... Uh, entities that are providing services of such significance to people who are 
so vulnerable to abuse and exploitation, there will always be some whose performance will be much less than optimal, and I'm not talking about any particular provider. And the kind of issue that Ms Bennett is raising is the possibility that an investigative process will be compromised by the lack of, invest of independence of a particular investigator. And again, I'm not suggesting that any particular investigator has been uh, anything other than independent, but there is, a, there is always that risk and one should probably try to mitigate that risk. Well, of course, um, the, uh, I guess the analogy in terms of what, uh, what you're uh, suggesting, if I can, um, uh, uh, if I can make the comparison, is the way the audit scheme uh, works, where we have an arrangement with the. Uh, joint accreditation scheme of Australia and New Zealand that uh, assess the suitability of auditing bodies. Uh, uh, we appoint auditing bodies, we train the auditors who will, uh, who will work on audits, so we directly train them. Uh, but um, uh, uh, in that particular uh, uh, setting, they're third parties and registered providers must use those auditors for their audits and they must uh, they must have a scope of work. So there's, an I guess, an existing feature of the system that is not uh, miles apart from mm. that idea. But, uh, but in respect of uh, investigators, it's not something I've looked at. And, and I would imagine that um, uh, uh, my experience in the past is that uh, these schemes are not without their challenges as well uh, in terms of maintaining quality, etc. Certainly. Yeah, Ms Matt. Thank you, Chair. I'll leave independent investigators for a moment because I'd like to talk about auditors. Sorry, I missed... But I'm sorry, I'll, I'll leave independent investigators in a moment. I have one final question about them, and that is, um, do you have any concerns where independent investigators are engaged through lawyers and legal professional privilege is claimed over the content of those reports? Um, as the regulator, my view would be that uh, if we uh, are seeking uh, an independent investigation to be done, that we would uh, expect uh, to be able to examine the material that comes from that uh, investigation. I have quite strong information gathering uh, powers. Um, and the purpose of seeking an independent investigation is to shed light on something that's happened, both in order to determine what to do in respect of those particular matters and given the system that we're working in to draw lessons that may assist in preventing problems from arising again. So I think the uh, process uh, under which independent investigations are carried out by providers at our request should allow for those objectives to be met. To put it another way, the appointment of an investigator to investigate the conduct of a service provider where the outcome is a report that is subject to the client legal privilege of the service provider is a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Yes, that would not strike me as being... Uh, uh, Consistent. ..within the spirit no. uh, of the process. Do you expect that independent investigations should be provided to families of people resident in a home, for example? Um, we expect that uh, that subject to you know, avoiding things that prejudice uh, matters or uh, or uh, breaching privacy uh, obligations, etc. That families should be kept involved and provided with information that assists them to understand uh, what's happened and. In some cases, that might mean uh, the provision of a, uh, of a comprehensive report of an incident, and in some, part that, in some circumstances that might mean the provision of something uh, less than that. There are 
um, obligations on providers in respect of their own incident management systems around keeping uh, participants and the loved ones of participants informed. And those are, of course, things that we can examine through the audit uh, process or indeed take complaints about. Um, what about reports that, prov that, ca that operate with a dual purpose, both for industrial relations purposes and in independent investigation purposes. Is that possible in your mind, to have that dual character? Yeah, can I just clarify mm. one thing before mm. the witness answers the question? I'm sorry? Is the witness being asked about NDIS investigations or investigations being done by the provider? Because I'm concerned there's a oh, bit sorry. of overlap between those two things. Sorry. Where, where an independent investigator carries out uh, a, an investigation uh, like the kind referred to in your statement at paragraph 111 in relation to a reportable incident. I'm sorry, that's the wrong paragraph reference. Um, but in relation to a reportable incident and the service provider engages um, an independent investigator to fulfil its requirements or its obligations to you, can that report have a dual character in your mind? Can it be both to inform the content of industrial relations obligations and to satisfy your requirement that there be an independent investigation? Um, frequently these matters will touch on the conduct of workers. Uh, if, uh, if a complaint or a reportable incident comes in, there's an allegation of uh, abuse or neglect uh, I, and we're wanting to understand uh, what happened, where in the provider understanding what happened, they may need to take appropriate action as an employer in terms of whether or not there's been a form of misconduct and what the sanctions should be in respect of that misconduct. I think that uh, uh, often the investigation would be both responding to the the matters that are of interest to us and where the employer, the provider in this case, would be looking to, uh, to uncover things that may uh, require them to take action in respect of a worker. They may need to do additional things in response to that, but I think given the nature of what we're talking about here in terms of the types of allegations that are being made, uh, many of these reports would figure in, uh, in additional actions that a provider would have to take. Now, we've talked about independent investigations and you've mentioned audits a few times. Now, I think in your supplementary statement, you talk about a stage one audit of Sunnyview that was carried out, Sunnyfield, sorry, that was carried out, um, and I think that's at paragraph 28 of your supplementary statement. Yes. Now that um, that's carried out by an audit provider, is that right? Yes, the arrangements I just explained to the chair. Um, there are, I think, presently 19 audit bodies that are approved to conduct audits. You cannot have an audit conducted by anyone other than those bodies. Yes. We have an arrangement with the JASANTS, as they're called, the Joint Accreditation Scheme of Australia and New Zealand, uh, who uh, are, um, uh, in a sense, a peak organisation that, uh, that look at the suitability of auditors. Um, when individuals are uh, going to be working on our audits, we actually train auditors. So I can't tell you exactly the number at the moment, but there are several hundred auditors working for these 19 bodies. When you make an application, or sorry, when a provider makes an application for re-registration or a new registration, depending on the classes of supports they're seeking to pro provide, 
uh, it's the commission that generates the scope of audit. And then if you're the provider, you take that scope of audit to one of the, at the moment, 19 audit bodies and get a quote, and then you determine which of those bodies uh, uh, will conduct the audit. And a stage one audit is, um, is that a, what you might call a desktop audit? Uh, it's the stage two audit that does the site visits yes. uh, and samples participants, etc. And there's also, uh, I think this is referred to in my statement, a component as well, a suitability assessment where we are examining the provider and key personnel against a range of parameters that are set out in the Act. And do all stage one audits progress to stage two? Uh, sometimes providers withdraw. Um, uh, you know, in a scheme like this where uh, there's a very large scale uh, transition of people who were subject to very uh, different regulatory arrangements, there are a range of points at which people might either might choose to exit the process. Now, you tell us at paragraph 28 that Sunnyfield Stage 1 audit was conducted on 11 March 2019 and its Stage 2 audit was conducted between 8 and 17 April 2019, is that right? Yes. So the Stage 2 audit involves going to, the, going to various sites operated by the service provider, is that right? Yes. And speaking to some employees and um, speaking to some clients, is that right? Yes, and families of clients as well. Yes. Now, uh, you tell us that the auditor selected nine of Sunny Fire, Sunnyfield's 65 outlets or sites to include in the audit sample. Can you tell the commissioners how those nine were selected? There's a, uh, a notifiable instrument as part of the uh, uh, arrangements for auditing that sets out the guidelines for auditors, including details on sampling. So the auditors themselves would have had uh, the information on the range of... Um, on the range of uh, sites, the, the range of homes that Sunnyfield manages, and they would have uh, made the decision uh, for this, uh, in a sense, first re-registration uh, audit for Sunnyfield. Now, as at April 2019, there had already been complaints about the, the Western Sydney house that we've been discussing in this case study. Uh, were those com and, and those complaints had reached your office by that stage, is that right? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Now, that didn't trigger the automatic inclusion of that house in this audit? The audit guidelines set out the sampling that auditors do. We don't, uh, we don't uh, in these initial re-registration processes, sample for the auditors, although in the mid-term reviews we may... Uh, focus auditor attention on issues that we've observed between the initial audit and those reviews. Well, that, that was my question. Is there scope for you to focus the auditor's attention on a particular aspect of a service provider's delivery? Uh, at different stages of the process. Registration, as I've said, is a three-yearly process, so it's not a... Uh, and, and certification, what's quite, I guess, different about this scheme to some other audit schemes in what are often described as human services environments is that they're not just auditing against accreditation standards, you know, what policies do you have? They're actually looking at standards that are expressed in terms of outcomes where participant and uh, family and worker interviews are important. So as we go through that cycle of a re-registration audit for a transition provider mid-term review, and then the three-year audit process based on our, I guess, emerging experience with a provider, we have uh, we will we'll have opportunity to influence those things. I see. So is the position that that's an emerging area of focus um, for the Commission to direct future audits to areas of concern? Well, the mid-term review for an auditor yes. uh, may, for instance, look at those things that... Uh, were initially detected as minor conformances in an audit where the auditor uh, indicated uh, the requirement for certain actions to be taken before that they before they could recommend that the agency was suitable or that the provider was suitable to be registered 
and you would expect a mid-term review to look at the extent to which there has been improvements on those things and it also would provide an opportunity for the Commission to flag other matters that it may be concerned about. I see. And is this the sort of thing that ought, ought to have been flagged for the auditors around this time? Uh, I can't say in respect of this particular uh, audit. This was an initial re-registration audit, so for every one of the almost 20,000 providers that we've transitioned, mm. uh, they're going through the first audit against the practice standards. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those audits will have occurred very uh, soon after uh, transition, some longer. Uh, the phasing of audits was uh, determined, uh, given that our jurisdiction commenced on a particular day, we had had no history of regulating these providers, states and territories who had regulated those providers, yep. provided advice to the Commission on how we ought to approach the phasing based on things like the recency of audits in, in pre-existing systems and the general performance of those providers under whatever arrangements had existed in states. All right. And, and then you tell us at paragraph 33 to 36 of that statement that Sunnyfield was assessed as having insufficient evidence to demonstrate that the second and fourth quality indicators for the complaints management and resolution practice standard uh, had been met uh, and those practice standards you set out. Um, and then you said that Sunnyfield was required to take corrective action at paragraph 35 um, and details of that corrective action you've identified at paragraph 36. Can you tell the Commission as things stand today um, is the Commission satisfied with the response it's received? Uh, the auditors, uh, the way this process works, uh, the auditors identify the non-conformances. The auditors uh, then indicate what they would like to see in order to assess whether or not uh, the, uh, the provider has treated uh, adequately those matters. And they do that before they recommend to us that a provider is suitable to be registered because uh, uh, they conform with the practice standards. So it's, uh, it's an independent audit process by uh, qualified audit bodies, trained auditors. They are ultimately making the recommendation to us once they are satisfied based on what they have observed through the process that uh, for the purposes of auditing against the practice standards, a provider has met the, uh, the, uh, the standards set out. All right. Um, now, you've heard, have you monitored the evidence that this Commission has heard this week at all? Mostly, um, except when I've been in lifts or attending to things that, uh, that uh, uh, couldn't be avoided. Yes. Uh, now, you will have heard um, the evidence of Eliza about the proposed eviction of her sister, Melissa. Yes. Uh, and your office, I think you tell us, had some sporadic involvement in the eviction complaint on behalf of Melissa. And just to summarise, as I understand it, at the time of the eviction notice in June 2018, your office had no jurisdiction because it hadn't yet commenced in operation at that time. Is that fair? In June. 2018. June 2018. That's that right. right. We did not commence. And uh, and I would like to say that I don't think in my statement I've suggested that we had sporadic... I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything pejorative by that. I meant um, ongoing and um, as needed involvement. Yes. Uh, so from 1 July, you could consider Sunnyfield's actions after that date. Is that right? That then fell within your jurisdiction to consider a complaint about the conduct after that date? Uh, some elements. I think yes. the, the, uh, my witness statement steps through this, but I think initially Commission officers said, well, this happened before we had jurisdiction. And I think uh, when Eliza came back to the... Uh, that happened, I think, on about the uh, 6th of July. And I think when Eliza came back to us... Uh, uh, a couple of weeks later and said, well, the, uh, the eviction is still, uh, it has not occurred. Uh, on about the 23rd of July or on the 23rd of July, the Commission said, well, 
yes, this is a matter that is still live, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the New South Wales Ombudsman is looking at a raft of other things, we can become involved in assisting Eliza with the complaint about eviction. It really was at a transitional point between the two agencies, wasn't it? Well, it was. We literally were on our fifth uh, business day of operating when the initial contact was made uh, with Eliza and roughly a fortnight later, uh, after she had come back to us, we were able, I think, on the 23rd of July to determine that we would accept the complaint in respect of the eviction. And, and to just summarise, it's fair to say that you tried to prevent the eviction taking place before Eliza had been able to source alternative accommodation for Melissa, is that right? Yes, while well, we understood that she wished to seek uh, alternative accommodation and was actively looking, our focus was to ensure that uh, an eviction did not occur and that continuity of support for Melissa was paramount in that process. Um, and you obtained an undertaking from Sunnyfield to that effect? Uh, Yes, um, I think, uh, in fact, the paragraph that I needed to adjust the date on, I think paragraph 29 refers to a phone conversation in which that undertaking, undertaking were, was given uh, verbally by the provider and then there was a period uh, of uh, a little toing and froing before there was a commitment from the provider in writing towards the end of August. I just pause there and let's leave the actual case study and step into a hypothetical for a moment because I'd like to explore what would have happened in an alternate timeline where, and I stress this didn't happen, but what would have happened if um, Melissa were dropped at a hospital on the 6th of September, the day after the proposed eviction? Would your office have any, any involvement Assume that, that notice was given, the notice period expired in accordance with the contract. I'm trying to understand how the agencies fit together. Is that a matter for your agency? The way we uh, work in these crisis situations is essentially we work with, uh, with the NDIA. Uh, we're not uh, uh, a direct... Uh, support provider at all. We regulate providers. So in circumstances, obviously in any of these circumstances, we're looking uh, at the interests of the participant uh, and, uh, and how to ensure that there's continuity of support. So we have established operational relationships with the NDIA around, uh, around these matters. We might, um, and of course, depending on the exact circumstances and what uh, what particular uh, features of the situation dictate in terms of what will be in the best interests of the participant, then we may, uh, in such a hypothetical, invoke some of our regulatory powers to ensure that uh, that uh, something happens uh, to prevent disruption of continuity of supports, or indeed. It might be the case that finding alternative uh, supports and accommodation is in the best interests of the participant and the NDIA would work with providers on, uh, on actioning that. Okay. I'd like to understand so, that. Because, Ms. Oh, Manor, sorry. may I inquire how long you're likely to be? Uh, I, I, I can be quite quick now, if the Chair pleases. If that's... But, uh, yes, I, those, I'll take that as a hint. And I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious that you want to catch a 4.30 plane. Which I wouldn't want to miss lockdown. The, yes. the thing that is uppermost in my mind. Yes. Thank you, Chair. I'm grateful. Uh, let me um, quickly ask these, these questions because I was interested in your statement, paragraph 59 of your first statement, that you said you can't compel a registered NDIS provider to provide supports. So what are the regulatory interventions that you're talking about there that you might be able to invoke in the event that someone was dropped off at a hospital and left? Well, I can't conscript providers no. because there's not a... Um, that's not the way the 
commissions been uh, established, but the powers that we do have, and I think I've uh, elaborated in my witness statement that uh, these uh, powers, in a sense, have been uh, progressively switched on as providers move from being transitioned providers to fully registered providers, that we are able to take uh, action using a range of different powers. So if, if the assessment was that a provider uh, was doing something that was going to cause a disruption to supports and services where they were a registered provider and have and no longer a transition provider and have particular obligations around continuity of supports. Uh, we might use a compliance notice that relates to those conditions of registration. Uh, we may, even for transition providers, given that the code of conduct is expressed I think in adequately broad terms uh, and registered providers are subject to the code of conduct, we may seek to use the compliance notice powers or indeed some of the other measures in the Act. Um, but it may be the case that the behaviour of the provider in that circumstance would cause us to question whether or not the ideal circumstance was to reinstate what had existed before then, in which case the priority always will be how do we ensure that the person with disability in this situation is provided with the most appropriate supports quickly and in the hypothetical you're outlining, that would, that would be the focus and then the Commission would examine whether the behaviour of the provider who had uh, initiated this action warranted some kind of uh, regulatory response from us. One final question. If in a shared independent living environment, if all residents and their families wanted CCTV cameras installed in communal spaces, is that something that you have a view about as to whether appropriate or not? So I do think it's... Uh, I'm trying not to say complex. <laughs> I think it's... I think there are a range of very significant issues in responding to that. And so what I would say is that my observations are not intended as broad brush. The rights of people with disability to privacy are real rights. They're expressed in many of the authorities that are relevant to this Royal Commission and directly relevant to my statute, etc. And I think, as has been discussed in hearings of the Royal Commission before, these accommodation services are people's homes. So it's not a small thing to consider surveillance in somebody's home. And a home is not like an airport where there are communal spaces that are very clearly communal and other spaces that uh, just, you know, isn't off the top of my head example. Um, so I think the question of the use of CCTV in people's homes <coughs> is really, uh, you know, a question that, that has lots of complicated pieces. I think there are circumstances probably where there is agreement between people who are uh, entitled to make decisions on behalf of their family members where they would all have the same view. And I think that uh, if that's the case, then there are a set of issues for the provider in that circumstance about how they respond to that request without uh, uh, failing to uphold people's rights to privacy. So what is being recorded? Where is it being recorded? Who is able to look at that material? How is that material secured? The other thing I would say is there are... I, I know that there can be a general observation that people don't care about privacy anymore because lots of people put their lives on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. I don't think we can assume that everybody who goes to work every day thinks that their choice to put all of their meals on 
social media suggests that they are comfortable with no privacy in other areas of their life. And I am, I guess, making a serious point here. We want to attract people into the NDIS workforce who have the innate qualities and the motivation to provide high quality supports to people with disability. I think uh, there may be very good people who behave impeccably at work who would not necessarily like the idea of being filmed at work, not because uh, they're doing anything untoward, but because they don't like the idea of, uh, of being surveilled at work. So my view is that there might be circumstances where people are in perfect agreement around something that the use of CCTV in a set of circumstances where there's a low level of trust and there are issues that work against some of the things that would naturally build trust, but that very serious questions need to be considered in how that would actually be managed. And more broadly, I don't think one can generalise from a specific example around whether or not uh, such a thing uh, has a generally broader application in many uh, 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 many of these homes. You would have people living, participants living in those homes who will have their own views, which may be at odds with their family members, but they're people who can express their own views and where there may not be perfect accord between family members. So I, I do think there is genuine... Uh, complexity in this issue, uh, but uh, it needs, I, I guess, to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, but the rights of people with disability to privacy must be a central consideration in how such a thing works. Thank you, Mr. Ed. Uh, Chair, those are the matters. Thank you very much, Ms. Bennett. Um, May I, Ms Downs, do you have any questions? No questions, thank you, Chair. And I assume no other councils. I, I do have one narrow topic that I want to explore. One um, topic, yes. All right. Thank you. Briefly. Uh, Commissioner Head, my name is Doug and I'm here for Sunnyfield. Um, do you know whether uh, SP1 or SP2 uh, still work as disability support workers in the sector? Uh, no, I do not uh, know uh, where they are currently working. I can explain what the controls are in the sector that would no, mitigate I think just against limit, that. Perhaps perhaps lim ask. Limit your answer to the question that was asked. Anything? Thank you. Perhaps I'll ask this way. Do you know whether either of those men have applied for a clearance to work as support workers? Uh, state and territory clearance units, state and territory governments manage the clearance process, so it would be a... a body in a state or territory that would receive uh, an application uh, from uh, those uh, from SP1 or SP2. And of course, uh, one of the features of national worker screening in the NDIS is that wherever you are in the country, uh, uh, when an application is entered, uh, it's not just uh, any criminal conviction that appears from around the country, but whether or not there have been charges laid. And under the worker screening arrangements, there are qualify, dis automatically disqualifying offences, presumptively disqualifying offences. But of course, for the people undertaking that screening in a state or territory, the fact that somebody had been charged would emerge uh, and therefore be a relevant consideration where they're exercising discretion. I think the answer to the question was no, yes. actually. Sorry. Uh, yes, carry uh, on. So, so you... Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so you don't know whether either of those men have been banned or excluded? Now, the banning order functions are functions of the Commission. Uh, we publish... Uh, so SP1 and SP2 have not been banned. There is a process wherein the Commission is working through all matters where it is able to ban people now who it was not able to ban at certain other points until the legislation was amended. There is a process in place to work through both those matters but also the flagging in the worker screening system of uh, matters and at the point where uh, anyone who is banned as a consequence of that review uh, is banned 
then that would be published. We publish all banning orders. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner. I have no further. Thank you, Mr. Duggan. Mr. Head, thank you very much thank for you, coming Chair. to the Royal Commission once again. Thank you for your detailed statements and for your evidence today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Eastman. Uh, Commissioners, that concludes the uh, hearing. We have prepared some directions and they've been circulated to the parties and I think you now have a copy I do have a copy which I understand of, uh, that uh, you're prepared and that uh, has been circulated and I assume agreed to. Yes. I don't know whether you need to read the directions uh, this afternoon, but we can certainly publish them on the Royal Commission's website. Look, I think it's probably a good idea to read them. I know it's a little tedious, but in case there's anybody following who wishes to know what the directions are, I will Thank you. read them. Um, one, any witness who took questions on notice during this hearing should provide his or her answers in writing to the Office of the Solicitor assisting the Royal Commission by 11 June 2021. The answers should be targeted and concise and not address additional or unnecessary matters. Two, counsel assisting the Royal Commission may tender those responses into evidence. Three, in addition, given that during this hearing it has become apparent that some documents may have been overlooked in responding to notices issued by the Royal Commission, parties should ensure that further checks are conducted to ensure that those notices have been fully complied with. As far as documents for tendering are concerned, four, by 18 June 2021, Council assisting the Royal Commission will provide a list of those documents she wishes to tender into evidence, including responses to questions on notice on a confidential basis to the parties with leave to appear at this hearing. Five, parties with leave to appear should advise the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by 2 July 2021 if they wish to suggest any additional documents for tendering by Council Assisting. At the same time, they should identify any parts of those documents that they consider need to be removed before the documents are made public. Six, Council Assisting will tender those documents into evidence which she considers appropriate in chambers by 9 July 2021. As far as submissions are concerned, seven, Council assisting the Royal Commission will prepare written submissions following the hearing. By 6 August 2021, these submissions will be provided on a confidential basis to parties with leave to appear and to any organisation that received a procedural fairness letter from the Office of the Solicitor assisting the Royal Commission in preparation for this hearing. Any responses to the Council assisting submissions should be sent to the Office of the Solicitor assisting by 20 August 2021. Those responses should be concise and should not include any additional evidence. Nine, after receiving all written submissions, there will be a short hearing for oral submissions which will be scheduled in due course on a date to be determined. That hearing may be conducted virtually. So those are the directions that will be made. Is there anything else, Ms Eastman? Uh, no, just on behalf of Council Assisting and the OSA, we thank all of the witnesses who have participated in this hearing and also thank all their legal representatives for their assistance in the course of the preparation and their cooperation uh, with the Royal Commission during the course of this week. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, is there any council that wishes to say something? Yes. Uh, well, I might have um, jumped the gun and play a little bit down. Chair, um, New South Wales wishes to place on the record uh, thanks to council for preparing the directions. One matter that is not addressed in those directions is uh, something I should put on the record, and it is that the New South Wales Ombudsman remains willing to assist the Commission if there's any further information that can be provided by way of historical documents or information arising from his work. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you for that indication. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like uh, just to make a brief, uh, some brief closing comments. At the outset of this uh, public hearing 13, I made three main observations. First, I noted that this is the first hearing since February 2020, which uh, members of the public have been able to attend in person. I expressed the hope that all future hearings will be similarly open to members of the public, commencing with our next hearing, hearing public hearing 14, scheduled to take place in Adelaide on the 7th of June, which is Monday week. Secondly, I explained that this hearing would investigate a case study involving a single service provider, Sunnyfield, and its conduct in operating and providing services to the residents of a particular disability residential accommodation located in Western Sydney. I also explained that the hearing is intended uh, to identify a range of policy questions that might emerge from the case study. In other words, the Royal Commission is seeking to use case studies such as this to assist in our investigation of systemic issues. Thirdly, a critical theme that has emerged from the Royal Commission's work to date is the interconnectedness of the experiences of people with disability throughout their lives for that and other reasons, the issues identified and addressed at particular hearings cannot be considered in isolation from each other. Let me deal with each of these matters briefly in turn. First deals with the pandemic. As to the first point, the disappointing events in Victoria over the last few days leading to a lockdown in that state demonstrate the fragility of the situation in this country concerning COVID-19. They also indicate that the Royal Commission continues to be susceptible to the disruption of plans for hearings and of other activities such as private sessions that are conducted by commissioners in person. It is too late, uh, sorry, too early to say at the moment what will happen to the forthcoming Adelaide hearing. We can confirm, however, that unless there are further very serious and completely unexpected developments, the Adelaide hearing will go ahead in one form or another. We shall keep people informed of developments as they unfold. The lockdown in Victoria is a reminder that the slow progress of the vaccination program for people with disability, especially for those living in disability residential accommodation, is not a marginal issue. The slow progress of the rollout of the vaccination program for people with disability was the subject of public hearing 12, which was held on the 17th of May. While no report of that hearing has yet been published, the evidence clearly demonstrates the urgency of ensuring that the vaccination program reaches people with disability and provides them with the protection they are entitled to expect. Unless this is done, the resurgence of COVID-19 in Victoria illustrates the potential for people with disability to experience very serious consequences flowing from the pandemic. The second point relates to policy issues. As you've just heard, directions have been made for the filing of written submissions. Any factual findings made by the commissioners sitting at this hearing and the commission will be made after the commissioners have had the opportunity to give careful consideration to the submissions that will be filed in due course. Without expressing any view as to the findings that may be made, the evidence uh, is sufficient to present uh, important policy questions that may deserve consideration both by parties represented at this hearing and the Royal Commission. I mentioned two such matters as illustration. Sunnyfield in the 2019-2020 financial year received directly or indirectly $87 million through the NDIS and $6 million in government subsidies. These funds were provided for the purpose of enabling Sunnyfield to support and assist people with disability, primarily people with intellectual disability. The question that arises for consideration is whether it is an appropriate for an organisation such as Sunnyfield, which receives nearly $100 million per annum in public funding, 
to be governed by a board and administered by senior management, none of whom, according to the evidence, appear to have had lived experience with disability. No one would dispute that providing services and support to people with disability such as Melissa, Carl and Chen presents significant challenges. There are undoubtedly support workers at the house and other houses like it that are doing excellent work to support residents, as indeed Mr Head implied in his evidence just now. But it is also unlikely that anyone would dispute that people in disability residential accommodation are extremely vulnerable to violence and abuse, whether perpetrated by staff or others. Questions therefore arise as to the establishment of procedures for making and investigating complaints. Important as those issues are, questions also arise as to the oversight mechanisms that should be in place to ensure so far as possible the safety and well-being of residents before any violence or abuse occurs. The third matter I mentioned was interconnectedness. The evidence of this hearing shows that SP1 and SP2 were acquitted of the criminal charges, with, of the criminal offences with which they were charged. The investigator, as we have heard, appointed by Sunnyfield, sustained numerous allegations that were made against SP1 and SP2, but also concluded that many others could not be sustained. I make it clear that I'm in no way critical of the magistrates who made the decisions to acquit SP1 and SP2. They had to evaluate the evidence presented to them by the prosecution. They found on that evidence that they could not, that is the magistrates could not, independently of course, be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that SP1 and SP2 had committed the offences with which they had been charged. Nor, as I'm not critical of the magistrates, nor am I critical of Ms P.O. for making findings that certain allegations could not be sustained. My point is a different one. At public hearing 11 on criminal justice and our issues paper on criminal justice, uh, we pointed to the difficulty of securing convictions in cases involving allegations of violence and abuse perpetrated on people with intellectual disabilities, particularly those who are non-verbal. The reasons given by the magistrates, which are public documents, repeatedly state that the evidence in each case was word against word. That is, the magistrates had to consider in each case the evidence of a single support worker against the evidence given by SP1 or SP2, as the case was. In the absence of independent evidence in support of one or other of the competing witnesses, the magistrates found that they could not be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the offences had been committed. Of course, as the magistrates pointed out, the alleged victims could not provide that independent evidence because the prosecution felt unable to call them as witnesses in the criminal proceedings. If an alleged victim cannot give admissible evidence, a prosecution may face insuperable obstacles. We heard evidence from Eliza and Sophia about their desire to have CCTV installed in the home. No doubt this is a proposal uh, that uh, involves complex issues and indeed again as Mr Head uh, explained towards the end of his evidence a short time ago. But the proposal put by Eliza and Sophia is a response to the difficulty the criminal justice has experienced in dealing with criminal prosecutions involving violence and abuse against people with disabilities such as Melissa, Carl and Chen. Uh, as, with Ms. as Ms Eastman has done, I would like to thank all of those who have uh, been involved in preparing this hearing. Um, as I've remarked on a number of occasions, an enormous amount of work is required by the staff of the Royal Commission uh, including but not limited to the Office of Solicitor Assisting and those responsible for ensuring that the hearing runs smoothly. It is indeed a very complex operation. A great burden falls upon Council, Ms Eastman and Ms Bennett. We are very grateful to them for their contributions to the orderly conduct of the hearing and to the other legal representatives who have appeared at the hearing over this week. 
Most importantly, we want to thank the witnesses who have given evidence at the hearing, particularly Eliza and Sophia, and through them, Carl and Melissa have been able to have their voices heard. We'll adjourn until all being well, Monday week at 10 a.m. for public hearing number 14. Thank you. Court, we will now adjourn. The Royal Commission is adjourned. <laughs>